Thanksgiving. It is a celebration of all that we are thankful for. So often, we gather with family and friends to break bread together on this day. But as we list the many things for which we are thankful, so few of us think about where the meal we are served actually comes from. We don't thank the farmers who grow our food. We don't thank the truckers who transport said produce. We don't thank the shopkeeps for making it easy to acquire. I think it's time we make a change and thank those who bring the materials to us. Today, we thank those who bring us the Elder Scrolls Legends. Today, we give thanks. Thank you, Marikan. Just as the gods gave us food to harvest, you have given us a cornucopia of cards to farm. Thank you, Solid Age. You made our drop farms possible. No feast is possible without a good farm. Thank you, Spanish Drop Guy. Your farm is the largest on both sides of the Rio Grande. Thank you, Legends Dex. Your recipes have made assembling our meals easy for chef and layman alike. Thank you, CVH. What good is food without a critic? Your meta snapshot tells us exactly what meals we should have been eating last month. Thank you, Expert AI. Like a backyard garden, you give us the ability to feed ourselves. We don't do it, though. And finally, thank you, Uncle Pete. It is within the House of Bethesda that we gather this holiday season, and we are grateful for your hospitality. From us here at Fun and Interactive, Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. All right, I think it's time that we should get this show on the road. Rock and roll, man. <clears throat> nice. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Ta-da! Happy Thanksgiving, everybody, early, since next week it'll be after Thanksgiving. That's true. What time do you guys usually go uh, Go up? Like, because obviously you're doing it on Thursday, but does it, uh, like, is it a, you guys do a podcast too, like a, an audio version? Yeah. yeah. So, Sweet. hello everybody, welcome, that's Frank Lepore, our special guest talking. Uh, traditionally, we're at 10.30s on Fridays, but we've had to do a couple Thursdays because Justin is bettering himself as a human being. And like you do, yeah, it's a like, lifetime process. <laughs> like, like you do, and a lot of reversal going on. We yeah. we do take the audio version of this, and usually I split it up into two one hour chunks because we do like an hour of talk and then like the Q and A, and we throw that on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much like what we do for our podcast as well. So uh, basically, exactly the same. Well, it's good to know that we are copying the best then, right? Yes. <laughs> well, let's, let's not go crazy. Oh, let's Actually, it's pretend... funny because we... Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, we both said go ahead at the same time, too. This is so awkward. Um, we were actually discussing doing a Twitch uh, like this, this like a live stream for our, our podcast next week. So it seems to be what like a lot of the more like the, like the really popular uh, streamers are doing. Absolutely. This way, too, we get ad revenue twice. <laughs> yeah, and like this is what Joe Rogan does for. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And like, yeah, like when you make content like we do, like that's super relevant, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I am really excited to have you here, Frank. I've been a huge fan of yours for a long time, and uh, I watch Modern Mondays on the Channel Fireball uh, YouTube channel. And having you, know, you as whenever, part whenever, of whenever day they come out, anyway. I mean, yeah, I know this week it was Tuesday, but I uh, I want you to know that uh, you're one of the first people that came to our mind when we were looking for guests once we uh, had enough episodes under our belt that we didn't feel ashamed asking. So, <laughs> Thank, yeah. thank you guys so much. I really appreciate that. That's super awesome to hear. Like yeah. every time people say that, I'm like, wow, really? That's great. Like, because I'm still like, I don't know, it still feels like a, you're like a small fish in a big pond, you know? So. Oh, absolutely. Charmer and I the other day were talking about how we're Z, 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 Z list celebrities, you know, like the <laughs> snooze button celebrities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I... but that just means they get you twice, you know? Oh, there you go. <laughs> just like that I... ad revenue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All I... coming back. I can certainly yeah. identify with the entire, like, imposter syndrome thing that's oh, yeah, going yeah. on. Like, no so matter... Those... Dang it. Yeah, no matter what happens, um, you know, anytime somebody talks to me and they say like, well, you know, you've made it, you're, you know, a partnered Twitch streamer and things like that. And I'm like, yeah, but really, though, because I don't feel like it. It's yeah, it's, it's very true. And you're, it's just like, well, 
like whenever someone comes up and they're like, Hey man, I really love your stuff. And like, I'll be standing with like Reed Duke or someone. And I'm like, are you sure? You know what I mean? This guy, it's such, <laughs> it's such a weird feeling, you know, Reed, Reed Duke is like a popular magic player for those who don't know. Cause I know Absolutely. you guys have a lot of, uh, you know, obviously Elder Scrolls Legends fans, but I'm not sure what the overlap is for magic. So, well, uh, for people who aren't familiar with you from magic, why don't you tell people where you came from, how you got into gaming in general? <sighs> Wow, that is uh how long is the podcast? <laughs> uh, I'll be honest with you, we shoot for fifty minutes and we end up around two hours most times. That's that happens every time, yeah. Every I know that time. feeling. Yeah. Um oh look, we talked about nothing for like forty five minutes. Exactly. <laughs> um so now basically uh about eight years ago I wrote to a site called TCG Player and I was like, Hey guys, this is who I am, this is what I've done so far. And like all I'd done at the time was um top eight at a few PTQ like just regular PTQs, mm-hmm. uh, which are Pro Tour qualifiers. And, um, they, they were like, Hey, that sounds great. We'd love to have you. And, uh, you know, let's submit us an article and we'll see what happens. And so like I started writing articles, articles for them and I was, I still, I was like, Hey, do you guys have video content? And they're like, not really. And I'm like, well, I'm video I was like, I'm really consistently video content. And that lasted for like seven years. Um, last year, 2016, I did my first pro tour and, and I was at the community cup as well. My magic uh, called like my list of accolades, I guess. But community Cup, Grand Prix Top Eight, Pro Tour Top Eight, and now I just make content for you know things for, for whatever needs needs me to make content, I guess. Like I made a lot of the initial content for uh, Elder Scrolls Legends for Bethesda. And that was sweet working with those guys. And I went to PAX with them and uh, did like live coverage of the game at, at the PAX arena and stuff like that. So, fantastic. I mean, you know, I like digital, I like card games. I like digital card games a lot because there's a lot of things you can do in digital card games that you can't do in physical card games. Right. Uh, one of which is play them on your, your phone or tablet. Uh, but I mean, like, even like as or, far as mechanics, like there's a ton of new right. cards that are coming out that you're just able to do super cool things right. that would never be possible in a physical game. It's also a great boon for people who don't have friends. <laughs> yeah, totally true. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I and, think I was gonna say I think that for me one of the big attractions to digital card games is that you know if you do find a good one if you find a quality one that has a competitive scene the appeal to me is not having to drive four hours to go to the Grand Prix or go to the PTQ because I have almost fallen really? asleep at the wheel a couple of times like i remember i got up once at like three in the morning and i drove for like four hours to indianapolis played for like 12 hours in a grand prix and then drove yep. home and that was a nightmare yeah and then you're like oh i didn't even get a chance to eat today whoops it's 9 p.m i forgot to eat because every round wants a time or you know whatever whereas like when you're playing on your tablet at your house like you can literally just walk around the house take the tablet with you play from anywhere <laughs> absolutely um so how did you get involved with uh direwolf when they just asked you to write those articles at launch uh so that's a funny story actually about three years ago um i had an interview with bethesda for a community manager position oh okay uh i, I love bethesda forever like they're one of my favorite companies uh fallout is my favorite video game franchise ever okay and, um, yeah, so I had an interview. I knew, uh, Pete Hines played, uh, magic. So we talked about that a lot in the interview. Uh, I met Matt Grandstaff and I met, uh, you know, a couple other people. Yeah. And I, I, I got offered the job, but I ended up not being able to take it, uh, for just like, you know, personal reasons at the time there was something that came up. I just wasn't able to take the job, which super unfortunate. And I, I have regretted it ever since. Um, but yeah, Pete, Pete, like I apparently made an impression on him and, uh, I remember Pete telling me like, when I top eighted the pro tour, he was like, he got out of bed that morning and he went to watch the, he's like, he got it. It was like 4am because of the time difference. Yeah. And he went to watch the coverage and his wife was like, where are you going? He's like, Oh, Frank's Frank's in the top eight. I gotta go watch him and see how he does. <laughs> cool. and I was like, wow. Awesome. Man. Super, super sweet. But yeah, so Pete and I just ended up becoming friends. And, uh, when he knew that enough, he, he knew enough about the game to be able to release it and tell me what was going on. He reached out to me and he was like, Hey, we, you know, we thought about you and we wanted you to do some of the content for us. And I was like, wow. I'm, it was super flattering. I loved the opportunity. It was awesome. And, uh, cool. You know, if they have anything else that they ever want from me, I'm, I'm more than willing to help out. So fantastic. You know, uh, about, uh, 
about your pro tour experience. I want you to know about six months ago, I recorded a rap song dressed as an orc and I included a reference to gut shot. Oh my. Funny <laughs> <It's, laughs> people, people bring that up and they're like, is that like your least favorite card? <laughs> like, no, not at all. It was a great event. Like that, that yeah. match was fantastic. Absolutely. You know, I, could not have gone better for me that pro tour could not have gone better so like no man every like every of every uh memory i have of that pro tour is just positive for me awesome man i mean like that's a really cool cool milestone i have to imagine in your magic career oh definitely and it felt like it was validating too you know because like i was always right. the guy as you know from modern monday i'm the guy who plays like the wacky decks like i don't play right. the top tier decks and so to be able to just do that at the pro tour and still do well i was like wow it you know it's validating to play to have played magic for 20 years and you know, be able to do this, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And also link me to that, to that video. Cause I'd love to see that. <laughs> you got it, man. I'll put it in chat. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, so charm and I've been making content for legends for about a year now. Uh, we were both in the closed beta. So we knew from those articles that were posted early on that you were involved in the game somehow. So mm -hmm. getting to hear from you, how is pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah, like, and, and that's the thing, like it was, it was great to watch all the changes taking place and like to be able to play it from like the get go is, I've loved the game since it, and it's funny because like a lot of people wonder if I really like the game or if I just had to say that because I was working on it. And like, no, I actually think it's great. I think it 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 takes a lot of the things that things like Hearthstone and Magic do, and it improves upon those. Yeah, I agree. and um, yeah, I I just I actually genuinely love Elder Scrolls Legends, and I think it's a great game. Cool. What uh, what are you playing these days? Like, what are your favorite decks since Heroes of Skyrim came out? Oh, uh, you know, it's funny because like ever since Heroes of Skyrim came out, I've been trying to. Like, I haven't been playing as much because it's... And this is something I have to, like, explain to people, but it's super hard to focus competitively on multiple games. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like if Magic is my, like, job job, like, that's what I do, it's right. super hard to also play games like Hearthstone and Elder Scrolls Legends competitively. Of course. Unless I'm also getting compensated in some way for that. Because, <laughs> like, it's just... It's hard to do, like, because I could just be playing Magic and getting compensated for that, you know? Of course. Um, But, yeah, when I've been playing Elder Scrolls Legends, which is, you know, on and off... Um, I've loved trying to make dragons an actual thing. And it was, I feel like it was when it first came out. Yeah. It's not as strong now, I agree. but yeah, but I think I like the cards are still super good and I like all the synergies they have. Like, I think it's, there's a lot of good cards. Um, yes. there's not a lot of in chaff the, in, the, in the legends cards. Yeah. That's, it's very true. I'm surprised. Like there's yeah. like, usually it's funny cause you look at a magic set and like, right. Maybe 16% of the cards are playable and constructed. Exactly. And, I think it's it seems like a lot more on the surface in, in Heroes of Skyrim. I totally agree. I think they've done a good job in general in, in, in making like maybe maybe five to ten percent of the cards are obvious filler, and the rest of the cards are uh, not all competitive, but cards that could be inspiring a person to play something stupid, which is I think honestly usually more important than encouraging like the the spike cards. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, and they're right, and there's all these Johnny cards that are like super. Um, they're just appealing, right? Like right, like the flink card that says like whenever you get. Whenever you gain life, it deals that much damage. Like, that's just cool. It makes you want to build around that. Yes, absolutely. So that's an interesting point to make because, like, Ring of Namira was one of the cards that I got really excited about when I saw it. But Same. because Legends has, like, a larger deck size than Hearthstone, and I know that it might, like, sound weird to say it, but in my opinion, I think it actually has a much larger deck size than even Magic because when you count like resources in your deck the actual cards that are inserted right are yeah. significantly higher um so one of the frequent criticisms i'll say about legends is that it's harder to build like true combo decks or really focus on those types of synergy you know how how do you feel or what's your experience been like in you know, I, I'm particularly interested in your answer just because you are known for playing those like wacky fun decks right so you know, what well, would see, be your I, take? I wonder if that's true, right? Because if you... So, like, I mean, there obviously is 50 versus 60 cards. But, I mean... Okay, so Magic, like, you have 30... So probably you'd say 36 cards and 24 lands. So you have 36 spells. And in in, heart, in uh, Elder Scrolls Legends, you get 50 spells. Or, you know, you know, yeah. non-land cards, non-resource yeah, yeah, yeah. cards, right? But the thing is, like, in Magic, if you're drawing a... Like, drawing a land is just worse than drawing a random card in, in Elder Scrolls, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, I mean, like just having those, those lands that are replaced with other cards, I don't think that makes your, your, your odds of like putting a combo together less. 
I just think you're going to have more. It's harder to fill your deck with cards that, that don't interact with the combo, I think, for sure. But I think in terms of the two games, like, I think you can still have the same amount of pieces, right? Like, if there's a combo, an eight-card combo, like a, a two-card combo in Magic that you dedicate eight slots to, like, mm -hmm. you can dedicate those six slots in, in ESL. And just because you have, like, 50, 44 ex extra cards, you know, in, in ESL, and you'd have... God, this is a lot of math on the fly here. Um, <laughs> so we said 36, so you'd have uh, 28 extra slots in Magic. Doesn't mean that um, because there's less slots in Magic that you're you're more likely to draw. You just you're just more likely to draw lands too. You know. Sure. I guess for me it was more. Is that, if, is that what you mean? I mean it is. Um, I guess you know more math on the fly, right? For me, when I take a look <laughs> at it, I think that the big difference though is not just the difference in cards, but also the other factors such as. You know, Magic, he can run up to four copies. And, as opposed to three. Right? You know, as opposed to three. And then, for me, I think that the the big hit is the the unique legends, right? Like, you can run a quote-unquote unique legend in Magic, you know, unless it's on a restricted list or something. You can run a unique legend, you know, in multiples and still, you know, try to draw those combo pieces. Magic also has, you know, like, tutor effects and um certain pieces are stickier on the board because the avoid. defender chooses blockers you know what i mean like the mechanics yeah, are different but i think that deck size kind of plays a, a bit of a factor in the variance as well so yeah and that makes a lot of sense actually because like you said uh the legendary factor is a thing and a lot of these obscure mechanics or these like crazy combo cards are going to be legendary you know what i mean yeah you because know, like... they're so unique yeah like ring of namira another one that comes up very frequently is like high hrothgar because yes it's, high hrothgar a, it's a cool well. build around card but it again it's one of and so not you only do you have get to this one of, find right? it but then like the other feels bad is like oh hooray i did find it and i played it on turn four and then my opponent played shadowfen priest and now right and I'm now just my done, one of right? Is like, right exactly right. and the other thing is like um let me I will say it makes killing people with a portcullis that much more, you know, of an amazing experience. <laughs> one of the one of the problems I thought about when we when I first saw High Hrothgar was that like you not only have to draw this one of, but you have to draw it before you start playing your other cards, you know, that actually affect it. So, right. you know, when you want your your zero nines to have their their attack equal to their health, then it's like, well, I have to actually play this after. So if I draw it right. on turn nine, then only things past turn nine are going to be actually affected by this. You know? Which is, I was like, oh, no, that's unfortunate. Right. I mean, if it worked more like Door in the Siege Tower, I think we'd all be a little more excited about it. Yeah. If yeah. I could have four of these, that'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but even but from a flavor standpoint, it doesn't make sense. Like, if you're going to have unique legendaries in the game, like, this is going to be one of them. Right. You, know, you can't have two. You can't have four or three. That's true. Do you think that there's a certain, like, in a world where there is not, an, like, a... Uh, a set rotation, you know, like uh, different formats eventually in this game. Do you think there's an inevitability to decks being predominantly unique legendary cards because of their relatively high power level? Oh, that makes that's an interesting question. Um, I think I think there's an an, an inevitability. That's hard to say uh, for <laughs> for there being mixed formats. Like I don't think you can keep one right. format forever. Like that's just it's impossible with card games. Otherwise you're, you're uh, at that point, you're pricing out the players who don't have those original sets. Of course. And uh, then it just becomes like Hearthstone. Whereas yeah. like, you're like, Oh, I can't afford. See, and then it's troubling because you have to keep up with the new sets. If you want to play the new format, but you can't right. play the old format because you don't have the old cards. So it's, you know, it's a double edged sword when it comes to card games. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting point. Cause that would be sweet to just have literally a 30, 30 card, unique legendary deck. Yeah, uh, because all the legend, even not third, even not like, uniques, like you can just have old legendaries, um, just because they're so strong and they don't really need to interact with the <laughs> cards. You can just have the best legendaries from right. the beginning of the game forward. I think at this point, it, the prohibiting factor between running an all legendary deck is uh, the relatively high casting cost of unique legendaries. Like, right. I was able to put together a deck a couple months ago with. 50 legendary cards in it that was just stone unplayable and when i paired it down to i think 39 legendary cards <laughs> like i got a couple wins in but it was still a really challenging experience yeah that's <laughs> and then if you go look at like if you upload your deck to something then it's like you just look at the cost of your deck and it's like yeah do you, what's what would the cost be for it was 40 cards? It, it was forty-seven thousand soul shards for the one that i actually ended up winning with yeah <laughs> i, I think... uh, it's utterly unbelievable I think yeah. that they do a wonderful job 
you know, I think that Direwolf, from a developer standpoint, they, they do a great job of making it so that your low-cost unique legendaries are typically ones that are more likely to be the build-around ones. And then the ones that are just like unique legendaries based on raw power are all the top end of your curve. So for every Red Bramin and Tazcat and things like that that, you know, cost nine, um, you know, you get things like uh, Delphine, for example, who definitely requires you to throw some shouts in and kind of do that build around. But, you know, she costs three. Um, Galen is another great example from uh, the set that's coming up, right? Like he was one that was revealed and... Certainly, you can synergize him with other unique legendaries, but, you know, you're not going to be, even if you draw them, you're not going to be playing them until much, much later in the game. So I think that there's a, a good balance in terms of cost there. Yeah, and it's funny because you mentioned, like, cards like Tazcad, which had a lower cost at one point. Right, right. And you're like, no, no, it's actually too strong at this cost. Let's raise it. L let me ask you guys both a question about Galen the Shelterer, actually. Um, this is a card that I've been really intrigued by, and I think Galen's, I mean, in my opinion, Galen the Shelter's power level is high enough that, uh, this, by the way, is the unique legendary 3 Magicka 3-3 three, three in Endurance that says, Summon, choose a creature or item in your hand, shuffle three copies of it in, uh, with plus three, plus three into your deck. I'm of the opinion, personally, that any deck that I was running three Young Mammoths in, I swap out a Young Mammoth for Galen every time. I mean, it's, yeah, it's literally just one, one, one less, right? Right. Yeah, it's great, and, like, it's... You know what I liked about this card? I, there's a certain elegance to this because you can say, choose a creature, creature or item, mm -hmm. and it gets plus three, plus three. Like you can give the same attribute plus three, plus three, to either an item or a creature, and it works yeah. the same way. That's awesome to me. Like just being able to say that. Yeah, there's you know, a certain it's, it's elegance so simple. to it. Yeah, like just give it plus three, plus three, because you yeah. can give that same attribute to either you know an equipment or a or an item or a uh, a creature, and it works the same way. And that's just that seems. It's a little thing like that that's super cool to me. I agree. Yeah, I think that he, I think that he's certainly going to have a presence in some mid-range builds, which is you know what I think you're alluding to, Justin. But I think that the real yeah. potential to shine is going to be in some interesting combo decks. Um, anything that gives you low-cost cards that you would normally be playing to cycle, you can now get additional value while still achieving their original goal i think that's where it shines so i think of things like enchanted plate thieves guild recruit you know god's help you if you happen to have one of the assassins from unglum in your hand but even <laughs> oh, even something nice. like what i'm really interested in personally is i want to see the other cards that have yet to been revealed uh that have treasure hunt because right. the ability to put like galen on uh on the board and then copy treasure map for example is really intriguing to me because then treasure map not only cycles but potentially tutors and is worth a plus four plus four something yeah, plus like four, that plus four is huge. you know and potentially triggering your treasure hunt like something like that to me is is what is really intriguing and i totally agree three more in the deck right so yeah i need to see more creatures with treasure hunt or more yeah i assume it's just creatures um, because that card treasure map has the potential to be the most interesting card in the set, I think. It's also funny that uh, there's an Elder Scrolls set that has treasure map in it, and you know, there's an ability called Treasure Hunt, uh, just as Magic has a pirate set with a bunch of treasure in it. <laughs> That's true. And, I was thinking... and Hearthstone's expansion is Kobolds and Catacombs, which also has treasure right. hunters in it. Like It's so weird how all these games have like similar ideas going on at similar times. The, the cynic in me says that uh, one guy somewhere had an original idea and then told his buddy, who's like, well, <laughs> the best thing we can do is steal their thunder. <laughs> it's just a, it's just a grapevine effect for all these games. Yeah, because I mean, I mean like, you know what Magic's working on. They got pirates and, and treasure and stuff. Put those in the right. put those in the set. Somewhere they're, they're playing Settlers of Catan somewhere and he whispers to his buddy at Bethesda. I mean, I know this happens. <laughs> I mean, hey, man. It could Pirates be that. Pirates are a thing right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could be that. Or, hear me out, it could just yeah. be that all of us who love games love all of the same stuff, right? Like, oh, who, 100%. That's who it. doesn't yeah. want yeah. pirate robot and not dinosaur ninjas? You know what I mean? No, I agree, man. I, okay, I'm, well, you combining them is a little strange. Like, <laughs> it, I don't know how I feel about dinosaur ninjas. 
as a guy who saw all five Transformers movies, after seeing the first one and being like, this is the shittiest movie I've ever seen. Oh, God, uh, your commitment is real. I totally hear you, man. I was like, look, giant robots, man. <laughs> I think I really like the first Transformers movie just because I didn't know any better. <laughs> I don't think it holds up. No. But at the time, I was like, this is amazing. Because that was like sort yeah. of like the first in a long line of um, like re- like like re what's the word I'm looking for? Like do overs? Yeah, Reboots? Yeah. yeah. That so like we didn't have a frame of reference that like oh these are all just bad. <laughs> I was just excited because it was a cool Transformers movie. Oh, right. it hit you right in the hit you right in the nostalgia. Yeah, yeah. I was not. And that they way. preyed on it. I was I was so angry. Like I remember walking out of the theater and I was like, Optimus yeah. Prime had. How lips. dare you? Right? Like, why does Optimus Prime have lips? And then oh, they Hollywood's had... gotta give everybody lips. Well, Turn, yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles even. Yeah. Well, and then <laughs> then. Uh, so they spend like the half the movie like trying to find the all spark or whatever, and then they find it, and then they're just like, "Well, we got to go to this other place now," and they don't even do anything with it. I was so upset, like I, I just my Not suspension her. of disbelief just I couldn't push through with Worth that one. <laughs> did you guys see? Uh, I don't know if this is off topic for this cast, but did you guys see yeah. that Justice League has like thirty seven percent right now? I have. I have heard. I was listening to NPR actually on the way home from work today, and they were not kind to it. <laughs> how hard is it? Like, how hard is it to make a movie with these characters that everyone loves? I know. Well, I, like, and especially when you, re- I mean, like, I can understand that maybe some there's some uh, script writing challenges when you have a like a walking plot device like Superman, but dude's not even in the movie. <laughs> right. And yeah. like, it's funny because then I looked up Thor, and I'm like, let's see how Thor's doing on Rotten Tomatoes, ninety two percent, and wow. I'm like. This is the third Thor movie in the franchise. Right. Like, it's not Avengers. It's not one of the. Right. It's not Iron Man. It's right. just Thor. Like, it's like a second tier character. Right. And this one is the, the third movie, and it got a ninety-two percent. One of the most ridiculous concepts, like, possible. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, how many? All right. This how many ancient third religion movies in a franchise get ninety-two percent. <laughs> right. Yeah, I remember yeah. this has got a couple years ago now because it was right after like Guardians had just come out. But I remember at that time they were trying to get Wonder Woman off the ground. And every time they pitched a script for it, it was just getting canned and canned and then like rescheduled. And I remember there was a meme floating around where it was like, you know, DC studio execs, we can't do Wonder Woman because the plot is hard. Marvel execs, we can put a raccoon in space. It doesn't matter, (laughs) right? Like, (laughs) and it's true. And Guardians is like one of the most popular series they had. Yeah, that's true. So oh, man. I, I so don't know weird. how you can get it wrong other than, well, one, they continue to get it wrong. Um, but like after seeing Batman versus Superman, I'm not surprised that it's getting low reviews because I can't imagine that they went that much different with their approach. And that one was also another movie that like made me contemplate my existence as a human being when I, I went to see that one excited because a buddy of mine was an extra. Cause they did some filming where I live. Um, and so I was really excited, and that was that was a hot steaming pile. Like that was a yeah, dumpster it's, fire. So it's funny because I like to watch it. Like I'll watch Man of Steel because it's just like, yeah, it's Superman and it's entertaining, but like it's not a good movie. No, and that's like there's a <laughs> distinction there. Like there's movies that I'll put on in the background sometimes and watch just because they're yeah. like cool characters. I like these characters, but I'm not confusing them with good movies by any means, you know? And so like, it's hard to spend 10 bucks to go see a a movie when it's literally not good. Yeah, no. So here's an interesting thing. Like of, of the DC films that are in what you would, I guess, call the current DCU. I actually think Man of Steel is the best because it, which is interesting. Well, to me, it was just like, they actually went the extra mile with the action sequences and made Superman feel like Superman, right? Like so many other Superman movies kind of skirt around it and Zack Snyder, you know, to his credit, finally just like let him loose. But I think that that, that's the reason that like it fails when you try to bring in the other characters. And it's been one of my like biggest complaints about just the DC universe as a whole is that like when you get the Justice League together, I don't believe that like half of these people like interact or you know whatever on the same plane i guess so, like the idea that superman ever needs batman's help for anything is just ridiculous <laughs> to me and, and i heard like aquaman in the new film is just going around like just being a big oaf man you yeah. know what aquaman's you know what aquaman's purpose in this movie is aquaman's purpose in this movie is that when i take my fiance we go <laughs> on the way home she looks at me with a little bit of disappointment i like that awesome. yeah <laughs> <laughs> why can't you be more like that jason mamau 
<laughs> She's looking at me right now, actually. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's more like Call Drago. Yeah. Yeah. Man. I, I can't help that deep down I'm Varus. <laughs> I guess... <laughs> On the outside, too, for that matter, shit. <laughs> I, I guess for me, like, one of the biggest things... Like, if I was going to just say, like... Oh, if, you, if you if you need an example of like how Marvel like semi gets it right, because I wasn't like even a huge fan of necessarily Civil War. I think Winter Soldier was better. But if you want to just take like a side by side comparison, it you could make the argument that the main plot devices for Civil War and Batman versus Superman are the same. It's people with parent problems, and they literally get together, and it's like you know. <laughs> Batman and Superman are like whispering Martha together and then on the other side it's like literally like Iron Man and Cap have that moment where you know it's Winter Soldier and blah 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 like it's yeah. literally you could argue the exact same plot devices and yet Marvel found a way to not make it suck right like yeah I don't I don't know how else to really other put it then they made the same movie and one of them was infinitely worse than the other one and it's weird like I tr it's hard to pinpoint like what specific thing did you do wrong in these movies? It's hard to do. I can't figure it out. Like it's well, it's because yeah. it's too dark. It's, it's, too it's, it's maybe the, the, there's a darkness to them, and I feel like that's kind of pretentious. I think I think that it's both. It feels that, that way, yeah. Yeah, I think that it's both that, but also um, the characters are really bland, and because they didn't do what Marvel did ahead of time, you're, in my opinion, that's... anyway, you don't have the connection to them. I agree with that. That's a strong point because you look at Marvel and they're like, here's Iron Man, here's Iron Man 2, here's Captain America, here's Hulk, here's Thor, here's, you know, there was like at least five movies that came before Avengers. And like right. when you got to Avengers, this is a point I made earlier on Facebook. I'm like, when you get to Avengers, you know, all these characters, you care right. about them, you know what their struggles are, you know, you know how they interact with other characters. Yeah, you get their motivation. And like you can say that like with Justice League, hey, I know who Iron I know who Aquaman is, but you don't know who the DC cinematic universe Aquaman is, you know? And that's right. right. A lot of times that's different than the, the the character Iron Man in the comic books that you've known for 60, 70 years. Absolutely. Yeah, and I you know? and I think that was the biggest problem with Batman versus Superman, because it's literally like Superman saved the world, but he also pissed people off, and so Batman shows up and he's like, I hate the guy, he has to die. Rid and like, even that, I'm like, why does the world hate Superman? This doesn't even make any sense. That that's not that's not what happened in the Superman movie, <laughs> right? So, it's just yeah, a I weird. Mean, like, what storyline are you going with here? Look, I mean, I, maybe it's a, okay. I got a theory here. Maybe it's an extended metaphor for the invasion of Iraq, right? Like, Batman is George W. Bush, and he's like, look, we can't allow this guy to have this power. We need to uh, nip this in the bud. So he goes all out to remove this threat that's not really a threat. <laughs> Your your the fox in chat said no foreplay at DC, and I think that's accurate. Like they just really like let's jump right into it. Yeah, no, I think that's that's uh, true. I think that's a hundred percent accurate. And, and then, then in the end, no one is fulfilled. Yeah, it's a completely no, unfulfilled. No, experience. Nobody's fulfilled. And then so like the other thing is again like not to beat a dead horse, right? But like I just I don't have any like belief like. You got to see the only character you got to see before Batman versus Superman was Superman, and you saw him like having the fight scenes you would expect from a Superman, and then yes. you get and he's like supposed to be fighting Batman, and I'm just like, where's the Superman that was literally like traversing the planet in seconds? Like, why is this guy like yeah. in a car even remotely giving him an issue? At the end of uh, Man of Steel, like, yeah, dude, he killed, he destroyed a bunch of property, like an unreasonable amount of property, but. I didn't get the impression that everyone hated him, right? Like right. I wasn't like, wow, he's in real trouble. No one likes this guy. Actually, the the military is like, hey man, you're on our side. You're you know you're friends. They're like and, bow, right? <laughs> and then like so then you get to Batman versus Superman. And you're like, oh, everybody hates him. All right, that's weird. I guess. So th so this is <laughs> why do they hate him? I don't understand. This is yeah. an interesting part that uh, Zechnophobe in chat brings up. And he says, The other issue is that any Superman story has to spend all this time trying to build up a villain that could threaten him. And while yeah. I, I can get behind that, but believe it or not, um, I'm not normally a big Superman fan, but some of the best written Superman stories, in my opinion, are actually the ones where it's not one big threat, but it's yeah. like, how does Superman balance his time? And how do you go from, like, you know helping people versus letting people become dependent on you like there's this one shot story arc that they did where it was literally like superman's flying around on a slow night and there's some like elderly lady who is having problems or something and she's like saying prayers by the window and he just happens to hear it with super hearing so he goes and he helps her right does does the nice boy scout superman thing 
So then like the next night it's slow and she's like at it again so he helps her and then like it becomes a routine thing but then like real issues come up but now she's like dependent on him and it's that whole like you know what kind of you know what is your moral obligation for helping people versus teaching yeah, them to help that's... themselves and like you don't make the story about <laughs> Superman and what is threatening him you make it more about you know those moral dilemmas and i think that that's where the the interesting stories lie with him there's a similar story with uh there's a run that brian azarello did uh who's a, a really well-known dc writer 100 bullets and, yeah 100 exactly yeah and uh it's you know it's superman and he's it's so the, the thing I, I i have to defend superman a lot because people are like oh he's such a boring character he can't be beaten and i'm like well yes if you're looking at superman and thinking this character you know i i find in enjoyment and entertainment out of a character based on how powerful they are sure that's one thing um but superman is not interesting because of because he's super strong or not disinteresting even because he's super strong superman is interesting because like he's an alien from another planet he has no one here and you know he still takes he, he's one of us you know he defends people that aren't even him like he's they're not even like him right uh you know everything he's gone through like he's completely alone on earth you know very similar to, like martian manhunter and uh, there's like, there's this storyline and uh, this priest is like, you know, can, you know, I, I found out, you know, I have cancer or someone else has cancer or something. And he's like, hey, is there any way you could like, you, can you help? And he's like, you know, I, I could, I could burn the cancer out at a microscopic level, but that's not really what I do, you know? <laughs> and he's, you know, where do I draw the line? You know, as Superman, like, okay, so I, I cured your cancer. Do I cure everyone's cancer? Like, how do you, how can you live like that? You know, like you can't have yeah. your own life dedicated so like you have to draw this line this moral line as to you know what you're willing to do how much of yourself you're willing to give to you know the populace and you know it's an interesting question that like right. a lot of characters can't actually address because you know aquaman you can't ask this of aquaman like he just doesn't have that kind of power so like there there are interesting questions you can bring up because of superman's power and the fact that he can beat everyone up like that's that's nowhere near where uh, the interestingness of Superman's character should exist. Yeah, it's a good good point. So whenever someone's like, Superman's so boring, he's so strong, I'm like, but that has nothing to do with his yeah. character. To be fair, though, all those people who say he's boring are also, like, Batman fans, who I like to remind people that, like, Batman... Also beat up... But, like, Batman 1, theoretically, I guess, can beat up everybody, but I don't buy that. And 2, why would he want to? Batman needs his villains more than he needs like batman and bruce wayne right like my biggest like argument batman, against batman is like, that he doesn't have public like safety in mind at all um i stand batman. by i stand by this statement 100 percent. lego batman is the best batman movie that has ever been made because it fully <laughs> tackled everything that i've ever had problem wise with batman and that's that he he doesn't want to actually rid gotham of crime because he loses his hobby and he loses his identity and he'd have to he move on with identity, his life yeah. Batman needs like if, if Batman has to stop being Batman and he has to be Bruce Wayne, like he does, I don't think he knows who that is. Right. Yeah. Cause I mean, really when you look at like the Marvel equivalent, the Marvel equivalent is Iron Man, right? Both lost right. their Tony parents. Stark. Both are billionaire geniuses who theoretically don't have superpowers, but like are trying to help and do the greater good. But the difference is, is like Batman dresses in spandex and hunts around at night and like beats up guys with his fists. And Tony Stark like tried to make himself impenetrable and like then recruited a bunch like he starts the avengers right like he recruits a bunch of other people that he knows are better than him to like serve this greater purpose then you go back to batman who's like i catch guys and i put them in arkham and they keep getting out and on the marvel side tony's <laughs> like to be a better way <laughs> tony's literally like i built a super prison in another dimension and i'm so interested in upholding the law i will put heroes there right like there's such yeah. a stark contrast between the two that like really so when you, you look at it you're like contrast yeah you're, oh, you're damn it i'll do i would suck to say that dude yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. so you know it's just one of those like I, I don't know how anybody can like look at batman and and, and see him through those like rose colored glasses like it just drives me nuts also like yeah. it's interesting because tony stark iron man is like tony stark uses iron man to protect tony stark to to like to enhance tony stark bat bruce wayne uses batman to basically destroy bruce wayne mm. you yeah. know like he, like i don't think batman is even likes bruce wayne 
I think Tony Stark's more realistic character in the sen- it, because he's an alcoholic too. I mean, like the stress of doing what he's doing as a normal man with the uh, childhood he had, like that sort of like obvious. I, I think in his case, his alcoholism is a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. But like, I think it's a much more realistic and three-dimensional character. Yeah, I also right. I also think Tony Stark's weaknesses are a lot more relatable and and realistic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that one of the things that has always attracted me to Tony Stark, like even pre-movies, you know, I was a big Iron Man fan. It should it should come as no surprise if you know me because my oldest son's name is stark um <laughs> like and everyone's like oh you like game of thrones yeah i get i get that way more i, I totally yeah, I do but uh but I, like it's thing... so funny because i named my kid Littlefinger. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just because he has a tiny pinky um no we'll like i the reason that tony stark is appealing to me as a character is because his his arch enemy right like his nemesis if you were to be like you know Batman has Joker and, uh, you know, Thor has Loki and so on and so forth. I know what you're going to say. The the true thing is that it's it's Tony Stark. It's his own hubris. It's his self. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, exactly. His his hubris is 100% like, uh, that's why I loved when the cinematic universe made, instead of it be like Hank Pym that made Ultron, I loved that they made Tony Stark be the one that basically makes Ultron, right? Because it fits so perfectly with his character. He is his own worst enemy. He tries too hard. And sometimes, like, sacrifices the human element of things. And there was, there was a, an Iron Man storyline called Demon in a Bottle. And it was just about his alcoholism and, like, how he's, you know, it was, it was consuming him and preventing him from, like, doing what he's supposed to do as Iron Man. And uh, you can tell there was, that was very heavily borrowed from, for the, like, these, like, even Iron Man, I guess it would be Iron Man 3, where, like, he had a lot of PS, PTSD. Right. It felt like, felt like they just used that as a way to represent this storyline, you know, instead of like, cause you can't just have him be an alcoholic when you yeah. have like, you know, right. Yeah. Mostly friendly movies. So I actually think Iron Man three is my favorite of the movies, to be honest with you. I like it a lot because it's Tony Stark centered, not Iron Man centered. Yeah. And I found the, uh, I found the, the movie version of the Mandarin fascinating and, and, and really realistic, right? Like uh, the fake okay. terrorist, you know, kind of thing. Like I, I really enjoyed that idea. Yeah, I, I think of the Iron Man films three is probably my favorite as well. It was it was really enjoyable. Had great one liners. I I also enjoyed seeing more Tony, less Iron Man. Yeah, yeah. Well, I that's agree. also because Robert Downey Jr. is just super wonderful. Right, that's true. I, I mean, I think that to a large degree, you can credit the success of Marvel Cinematic Universe to Robert Downey Jr.'s amazing acting. He's basically <laughs> the backbone of that whole. Like, Iron Man 1 started it all, like, what, 10 years ago? Oh, at least. I can't uh, believe how... Far- yeah, 10 years ago, basically. Like, there's, like, apparently 17 Marvel u- movies now, like, in the cinematic universe. That's insane. Unbelievable. Yeah, and there's a ton more coming, right? Like, we're getting, like, what, four a year for, like, the next three or four years? That's the other thing I mentioned. I, I mentioned that earlier. I'm like, we're on movie 17 with Thor Thor 3, right? And it still gets ninety two percent. Like they're not they're not half assing it just because they're so far in. Yeah, that's true. And you, you look at the caliber of talent too. They're working on those films. Like the Russo brothers have made some amazing movies that aren't superhero movies, and then to see them bring in that caliber of that level of, of talent and dedication to a to a genre film is just pretty cool. It's real cool. I if, you, if someone asked me fifteen years ago when I was like a lot younger and look like just reading comics like every day, if someone was like, "Hey, man." In 15 years, they're gonna have an awesome, awesome, you know, superhero movie franchise with like 17. I would be like, never right. gonna happen. They can't make good comic book movies. It just doesn't translate well. Yeah, right. like I remember um, when they. I used to be excited. They would put in Wizard magazine like the uh, fan castings. Like if we yes, ever got an Avengers should, yeah. movie, like these are the people we would love to see. And I remember like being young and thinking, oh, I would love that so much, but never ever, never. thought it would happen. Those, yeah, because yeah. you also think those actors would never do it. Because like exactly. that was the time when comics seemed below like mainstream right. Hollywood. Stuff, yeah, like know? it was a big deal when they got Wesley Snipes for Blade. Yeah, you were like, oh, he's one of us. Yeah, All right. that's true. I, yeah, I, I had the same thought. I remember when the X Men movie first came out, thinking like, "Wow, well, Patrick Stewart." That's a, I, that's a name that means a lot to me. And then I realized like it was yeah. just from other nerd stuff. But I mean, it was, it was still a huge step. Become, also become a name that means a lot. 
That's true. That's you true. Jackson, like even if you don't like him as Wolverine, like you have to respect his dedication to that character. I think absolutely. <laughs> like he literally loves. He's a dude who loves playing Wolverine, and that's that's yeah. a, like that's a big deal. I agree. So, uh, Pete Creighton in chat says, "I love this weekly DC Marvel podcast. What do you guys think of <laughs> Agents of Shield? It's my favorite part of the MCU." Oh um, man! So I was I actually going. Go ahead. I don't. I'm not a huge fan of that show. I got to be honest. I liked it, and then I started. I started kind of falling off that train but the, yeah. I, you know what i do love about it is that it's literally a part of the marvel mcu right like there's episodes where samuel l jackson stars as uh nick fury right meanwhile the dc cinematic universe has no connection to their tv shows whatsoever and that's super weird why not i know especially when they have such a like uh, more successful stable of shows than marvel does right and and more successful than their than their movies right that's true I love their Flash. So, like, I think Grant Gustin is a great Flash. And I keep thinking, like, why why wasn't he cast as the Flash in the movie? Like, yeah. who cares? Just let him be the Flash in the movie because he's a great Flash. Good question. Yeah. So for me, I actually really enjoy Agents, uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I think that uh, it has a couple of things going for it and a couple of things going against it. Uh, going against it, I think that this last season wasn't necessarily super strong. I think that they spent, like, too much time in the alternate reality. But, like, everything prior to that, I felt was really, really good because they were... I feel really bad that what happened to Inhumans happened to Inhumans because I got I got the feeling that Marvel was going to make Inhumans their X-Men. I think they had resigned, like, we're never getting that franchise back, so we're just going to, like, release The Mist, and then, like, this will be the X-Men, and I liked where they were going with it. Um, I think the other thing that hurt it was that early on the show wasn't very good, and... One of the things that I remember thinking about, like, episode five-ish, is I was like, you know, the show's actually not terrible, but I really just don't like this Ward guy. He's super, like, robotic and stiff right. and not likable. And then, sorry guys, like, this is, like, three years spoiler. ago at this point. But, like, spoiler. But then, like, when when he find out that he's, like, actually Hydra and from every point there on after, like, I adore him as, like, the the heartless asshole, right? Like, yeah, because then it makes felt, sense. You're yeah, like, oh, okay. it made so much sense. Like, oh, oh he he was robotic because he was literally faking it the entire time. Um, but I just I don't I don't know if it was written that way or if he just legitimately got better as an actor. But I also felt <laughs> like his acting was significantly better for season two. Also, so it's funny that I think one of the problems is that uh, so all the Netflix shows have been great. I haven't finished Defenders because it's just kind of. It's kind of Iron Fist was eh, yeah, and I haven't finished Defenders because of that, but I'm really looking forward to Punisher that comes out actually tonight. So I might stay up and see how long I can see how many see when it comes out, and then I might just watch some Punisher episodes because that sounds Absolutely. great. Yeah. Um, but one of my one of my things is that I'm that I'm worrying about is that Marvel spreads themselves too thin right now because they have like shows on ABC, shows on Fox, shows on NBC. That like Legion is on FX, you know, and like yeah. there's like so many channels right now that have Marvel. TV shows. That's true. Well, like, I mean, you, you have to remember, like, Legion and <laughs> Gifted, uh, those are technically the Fox shows. So that's not like the Disney run Marvel. They're not technically part of the MCU. So while, you know, they have their hand in it, it's not necessarily the same. But Marvel does have, I don't know how, how many people, like, are as geeked about it as me and keep up. Marvel has a ton of shows coming out on other platforms and if you guys were not aware. So they have like Cloak and Dagger coming to the CW. They've got Runaways coming to Hulu. They've got... Um, it's funny because uh, there's two more. God, I'm drawing a blank now. Whatever the one that has like Squirrel Girl and Mr. Immortal, which by the way, they got Milana Vaintrub to be Squirrel Girl, which has me super excited. Um was basically the Oprah Winfrey gif right now. You get a show. Yeah. You get a show. So they do have a bunch of stuff coming and like... I would say I'm worried, right? Like, and I think that would be a great cause for potential concern. But I honestly feel like all of these shows that are going to be like tertiary are smart by Marvel because if you watch the trailers and then you pay really close attention to where these shows are coming out and what the source material is, this is like wave two of the MCU. This is targeting a younger audience. Like there's a reason they're doing Cloak and Dagger as teenagers and like on the on the CW, right? It's yeah. because they're trying to indoctrinate new viewers 
for like a post. Sounds infinity. so negative when you say it. Like it that. sounds so negative, but like this is the <laughs> truth, right? Get them like, while they're young. Like Disney, Hydra. if Disney knows how to do one thing, it's get the young viewers and get this yep. audience, and they they have to be thinking, okay, once we get done with Infinity War, what next? And I think that this is like setting the foundation for that. I don't think that they're gonna do it through like film but instead are going to do it through like TV and internet streaming and because they know that's also how you get to the younger audience. I think it's a really smart business move. Did you guys happen to read Runaways? Uh, yeah, uh, I liked Runaways. And that, yeah, what, I, what I loved about Runaways... Go, go ahead, Justin. I was going to say, I read Why the Last Man and then uh, heard about Runaways and ended up reading it in the library a couple months ago, actually. Nice. I actually love that about libraries that they have trade paperbacks. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> um, yeah, the best part about Runaways was that they had like super villain parents, right? Right, yeah. Like that was the coolest reveal. I agree. Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, that has but yeah, to be like, like that was. 15 years ago. <laughs> right, yeah. The books themselves were real old. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, like, weren't they major super villains in the comic books? Like Red Skull and like Magneto and stuff? I can't remember. I see. I'm not hugely familiar with with uh, superhero comic books, so like, I don't know. But they seem pretty important. I'm gonna look it up. I got the internet. Where ain't gonna happen? Right on. Um, yeah, because yeah, that makes sense. It was Brian K. Vaughn, so that would make sense that you were like, oh, why the last man's good? I'll read this other thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, to be fair, I also loved Why the Last Man. So, do you guys read Saga? I have Saga, but I have not read it yet. So that yeah. is in my queue. It is also in my queue. It's pretty enjoyable. You know, I was one of those kids who grew up uh, reading Sandman every month when it came out. So, like, uh, I, I kind of missed the. Uh, and we've talked about it in the podcast before, in my bizarre childhood. So, I kind of missed out on the opportunity to get into superhero stuff until I was a little older um, and my life is uh, in order. And so, I, I came at it from the uh, reading the Vertigo, the Hellblazer, the Swamp Thing stuff growing up and getting into the more entertaining, fun loving stuff as I got older. And, uh, these movies have came out just as I was ready to see them. Yeah, yeah, let's just throw that out there, too. It's not just like the DC Universe fails with their big characters. They failed a John Constantine twice now, both as a TV show and as a movie. And that is... That's, I love Hellblazer. And it's a good character, right? It's, not like it's, it's a boring character where you're like, oh, I just right. can't make a transition. Right. I bet you can. Yeah. Yeah. So, A Goat in a Boat... Again, I always love that name. Uh, in chat every, every says... Time. Uh, what do you guys think about Mentor's Ring plus Flash combo deck? It'd be sick to see the rest of the Justice League get charged and just smash <laughs> the opponent's face. <laughs> like you do. Flash yeah. is why charge is broken. <laughs> <laughs> crying out loud. Yeah, oh, yeah. man. Yeah, actually, well, I mean, Flash... Uh... Yeah, I don't know. I got nothing there. I'm like, I'm trying to think of like something that's clever, but no, there's no, there's yeah, no real yeah. joke here. It's good enough on its own, I think. All my smart ass comments start before I had the punchline, so I hear you, Frank. <laughs> I'm like, hold on, I got to get on the ground floor, even if I have nothing. Yep, I hear you. <laughs> so I suppose, like, normally right about now is when we would transition to some Q and A, but I guess before we do that, we should at a minimum cover something from Legends. So <laughs> yeah, we got some spoilers. Um, we got some new stuff. Yeah, there was some some stuff revealed this past week. Um, I will link to the Reddit thread, but basically everything from uh, Grappling Hook down is all new. So we got yeah. uh, Grappling Hook, Dwarven Colossus, Cog Collector, Sails Through Storms, Hallowed Death Priest, and Reverberating Strike that were revealed. So uh, yes. what, what of those are you guys excited about and why? Uh, I think the... Um... What do you call it? Hollow Death Priest seems real interesting. Like the stats, three fives, kind of small. But being yeah. able to transform the highest cost creature in your opponent's hand into a shriveled mummy, like yeah. that's huge. Because there's certain things, like you can just time this in such a way that, like, oh, you have nine right now, and you, I know you have something sweet at ten, whatever it may right. be. So you can just play that on nine, and you're almost guaranteed to hit it. Yeah, if I, they have in hand. I think this is also like a mid-range mirror-breaking uh, arena card, like. I mean, just devastating whatever your opponent's holding on to for six or seven. I mean, even if it, yeah. all it hits is a Swamp Leviathan, like, that's, that's still, still huge. Now exactly. it's a 2-2 two -two instead, like, okay, right. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Purple, I've always felt, is one of the weaker colors outside of, like, maybe a supporting role in an, uh, a warrior aggro deck in Arena. And so I think seeing this as a way to encourage people to try to draft some more endurance is going to be pretty cool. 
Yeah, for those that don't know, Hollow Death Priest is a 3-5 five for 5. It says, summon, transform the highest cost creature in your opponent's hand into a shriveled mummy, so... Right. I mean, if yeah. they're holding, like... Um, <laughs> if they're holding Anduin, like, that dude's gonna be a 2-2 a two -two now. Absolutely. So, and you're transforming oh, it, so it doesn't go to the discard pile. Like, they have... There's no way to get that back into your deck, yeah, which is super interesting. It's more anti-Soul right. Tear tech. So, while everyone was complaining about Memory Wraith, I think that this is the card that more specifically targets Scout as opposed to Memory Wraith. Because this, you know, if you play this on five, unless they've done some crazy ramping, you can probably still hit the Red Brahmin or the Tazcad right. or whatever in their hand. Part also, um, I, said, I said Anduin instead of Alduin because I've been playing a lot of uh, a lot of Hearthstone, so <laughs> my bad. Yeah, no, no no worries. I, I mean, we got the gist. I will say this. I've been, like, making jokes about it, but I the more I think about it, this card should be renamed uh, Streamer's Nightmare. Because if there was ever a card that invited stream sniping, it is this. Um, oh, yeah, because you know exactly when to play it. You're like, oh, you just drew it? Sweet. Now now you're gonna, now I'm going to get it. Yeah, because at Absolutely. least with, with Barter, it was a random effect. So, like, even if you knew what the streamer had in their hand, there were still, you know, like, you had to calculate odds on if you were going to get something good if you wanted to play Barter, and then you also had to be playing Barter, which just doesn't <laughs> happen. But with this card, it's most definitely a, you know, it gives the advantage to somebody who knows what's in the uh, opposing player's hand, so... I love cards um, like like Reverting Strike that was real today. Three mana, deal three damage yeah. to a creature and all enemy creatures of the same name. Right. Like, this is just such a good card against the token decks. Yes. Or you're like, oh, you got a bunch of one ones or two ones or three ones now, whatever they may be. Yeah. Kill them all, you know, like with one card. It's super efficient. And I don't even hate dealing three damage for three mana. Like, that's not terrible. No, I mean, I, I think that the type of deck that runs blue for removal uh, to access a removal suite is the kind of deck that was using crushing blow to kill enemy creatures more than it right. was killing opponents with it and i'm gonna so, play you're gonna play this every day i think in your blue decks i agree i totally agree and, and again I, I i mean as a guy who plays a lot of arena i think it's a really reasonable arena pick you're not gonna usually hit more than one creature with it but increasing the number of uh, blue cards in your deck when cunning ally is such a bomb in arena yep is, is hugely important and um and removal is removal, right? Like exactly, I mean, exactly. It's three, it's three damage, three mana. It's perfect. Right. See, for me, this just sets up my new assassin Uncano OTK deck because I can <laughs> I can donate you all the tokens in the world with Nightmother and then play Uncano <laughs> and a couple of completed contracts to play two Reverberating Strikes. Except you can't because the fair. first one kills them all. Sadly, <laughs> but yeah. Like, <laughs> Like, but in theory, guys. Yeah, in theory. Yeah. No, honestly, the, the one interesting thing that I saw um, and that might catch people by surprise from this is that if you and your opponent both have a Naha Gleave out, you can target your own Naha Gleave to damage theirs and get around, sick. get around the uh, the targeted effect, which I think is kind yeah, of Yeah, if it's like a 7-2, that's yeah. sick. I like that. That's some good tech. It's worth pointing out too that just like all the other cards we've seen so far in the set, like this art is just top notch. Um, they, like I have always felt like Legends had amazing artwork and uh, just some great production values, but this set, like there has not been a miss yet. Like they all look gorgeous. Also, sales through. What do you guys think of sales through storms? Five oh, five for six. Uh, unique legendary pilfer. Summon the top card of top creature of your deck. I got a couple thoughts. Uh, my first is that uh, this shoot like fits pretty nicely in my opinion into the same kind of rage archer deck that is running uh quicksilver crossbow anyway and i think you know a quicksilver crossbow to pull out some of the huge creatures that's in that deck is pretty reasonable and just hitting face with it obviously is tremendous value my second thought is that i'm going to dress up like this character uh in the next few months <laughs> yeah i in, in the last like card review youtube video that i made i raved about this card for both archer and i think that in like mid-range decks that you're running agility um it might give you just enough reason to throw in one strift uh swift strike or two again yeah because anytime that you can get multiple triggers from this or yeah. in the case of archery play archer's gambit play the crossbow um yeah. it, it, i mean even if you hit like two drops like it's still fine you're still getting free two drops into play absolutely yeah. right and like it's not like so the thing is like one thing i get confused about a lot is uh hearthstone when you cast so they have Hearthstone has uh what's what's the word uh battle cry. 
battle cry is what I wanted to say, right? So, but like battle cry doesn't trigger unless it's unless it's actually cast from your hand. Yes. So an effect like this, it's not going to work if you put it into play. Yeah. But like in in Elder Scrolls, that's yep. not the same. Like if the creature says is if it has a summon ability, it's still going to trigger from sails through storms, which is which is huge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this card survives a uh, lightning bolt, so it passes the Quinrall burglar test. Um, <laughs> It doesn't have guard like Protector of the Main, so you can hide it in the shadow lane. Um, yeah. It, I mean, honestly, the only way this card gets better, in my opinion, is if it was a 4-5 instead of a 5-5, five five, because then you potentially don't always break a rune, whereas this way you're yeah, at least yeah. giving him a oh, shot of yeah, prophecy. Like but, again, like, the ability to either proc this multiple times, like, if you're in Monk and you got Master of Thieves going, if you run Swift Strike, like, that's massive. Or even in something like Assassin, right? Like, let's say you have no other synergy and you hit, like, a measly two-drop. Well, that two-drop could be Ward Crafter, and so you're getting a free body plus the, the ward. It could be Harpy, so you're getting free, like, tempo play with the shackle in a body. Like, there's so much good stuff that comes from this. I'm I'm excited to play it. You And if you hit, like, six-drop, seven-drop, if you have double pilfer, like, or double, double attacks, like, that's insane. Like, that's such yeah. an advantage. Yeah, free on Kano, anybody? Because you also get the summon oh ability. Tazcab. Yeah, this card, and the thing I love, so here's the, here's the funny thing I love about le uh, unique legendaries in, in Elder Scrolls, is that it makes my deck building, like I can be a little lazier in deck building, because now I don't have to figure out, God, this is a really good card, but do I run three? There's six. Yeah. Do That's I run two? Point. Now I'm just like, oh, I can just put one in and I'm good. I don't have to think about how many to put in the deck. I can just it put one in there. It also increases the variety of uh, circumstances you find yourself in in each game. Like, let's say you spend a couple hours grinding the ladder. You might not see your Ancano for, you know, four or five games in a row, and then you see it, and that experience is a lot different than your previous experience despite playing the same deck. So I, I, I love the unique legendary thing. I do too, actually, because then I don't have to worry about, like, man, is this one? It, it narrows down the things I want to tweak when yeah. I'm done testing a deck or, like, you know, after I play a match or whatever. I'm like, hmm, should I go to, should I lower the numbers here? No, because it's literally as low as it can go, and it's good enough to be in the deck, so. Yeah, I agree. You know, so, uh, a card I feel similarly about just in terms of, like, value and why it's a better card than it looks at first is Cog Collector. Um, one of the things that I think Cog Collector, by the way, 2-drop, 1-2 in agility. Pilfer, add a gear to last to Cog Collector, and last gasp, summon a random neutral creature with the cost equal to the number of gears on Cog Collector. I think people, when they first judge this card, often forget that there are zero-cost neutral creatures that you'll get when Cog Collector dies without ever doing it. No matter what. Yeah. Right. And uh, I unfortunately, one of them is Sweet Roll, but the other one is a 0-3 with guard, <laughs> which is still tremendous value. Tremendous value. Um, you know, I don't think you should ever plan on your card collector getting a lot of value, but I think it's a much better card than it looks at first. And if you're the type of deck that's really just aiming to stall things out and uh, win a, tr a long attrition type game, I think you should definitely look at this as a reasonable inclusion in, uh, in the two drop slot. Is there a, hmm, I wonder if there's any merit to a, an agility, like a neutral agility deck. Uh, I definitely think so. Um, we had a um, an agility card revealed that gets bonuses, the Nixhound Fabricant, right? Yeah, this is a 4 Magicka 3-3 three, three with a drain. Already not terrible, already playable in Arena. It says summon if you control a neutral card in play, shackle an enemy creature. I mean, That's this really is a good. huge tempo swing. The type of card that lets you pivot from being the reactive deck to the proactive, proactive deck. deck. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, think the, I think this card is good enough to warrant some experimenting with that i mean it's uh, just it's just better than spider right it's just upgrade well so i mean spider you have to be in the same lane but it can auto trade in uh with larger creatures it also doesn't require yeah that's the neutral. right that's fair but i will say that uh the thing that re really makes me excited to try the nyx uh fabricant is alter decks because the fabricant triggers that are triggering if a neutral card is in play will trigger off the of supports so if you're already having your altar of despair in play then you're going to guaranteed get the summon trigger when you get to your four cost and i think that that is something worth testing i agree that's one of my favorite things about new sets is just like and and everyone agrees that like when a new set comes out, that's the best time to play like ranked games because yes. you can pretty much play and try whatever you want because the metagame is so undefined. 
I agree. Yeah. I mean, there's always like one in ten guys is that asshole who's like, well, this is obviously the time to play charge aggro. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Which, to, in Actually, my it's defense, char- I've, it's, it's charmer. <laughs> in my defense, I've been playing that deck for nine months when everybody told me it was garbage. Like I had to go through months of people telling me that it was garbage before it caught on. So, no, and that's a way, real you, thing too. Like just yeah. people, like it takes a lot to validate a deck like that. Notice, by the way, no, no refuting the uh, charge of being an asshole. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't think that was the debatable part of the. Uh, the no, of course sentence. not. No, he's defending his his deck creation. But uh, I, I totally agree. Like, there's no time that I want to put in more hours into the game than right after a set drops. Yeah, hundred percent. Because I want to. I also want to play with all these cards. Like, yeah. they're cool. And you never. You always want to be the first one to like discover a thing. You know, you're like, hey, this card's busted. It's really good. Like to be the to be the person that finds that or like puts the deck together. That's super sweet. Yeah, I agree. So, um. Go ahead. I was going to say, some of the other cards that were revealed this week, I'm, I'm kind of curious to know what your takes are. I personally am really interested in giving Grappling Hook a try as well. Yeah, Grappling Hook's good. Grappling Hook is, uh, I think that Market, I'm sorry, not Market, I think Rage Archer has enough tools to already be good without running Grappling Hook, but I think that Rage Warrior, which is kind of a slower, grindier deck, could use this as a way to get, you know, a two for one, a three for one, and uh, reclaim the Shadow Lane, which it can easily lose. I, I think Grappling Hook's a really powerful card, and really strong in Arena. See, I think it's it's basically a removal spell, right? Like, you just yeah. you pull out really really obnoxious like utility creatures and just kill them yeah it's a removal spell but the thing that interests me the most and the thing i want to try pairing it with is that it's a removal spell that will trigger slay for you so when i think of cards like falk wreath defiler that you could exactly like hide in the shadow lane right even if there's nobody over there in a in a class let's say like warrior and they're thinking like okay he doesn't have shadow shift he doesn't have archer's gambit and then suddenly yeah. you pull a scorpion and yell, get over here, and smash something in the <laughs> face. Like, it's going to be really satisfying, and it's the sort of thing that uh, people will have to play around. But also, it's the first time we've seen, like, move your opponent's creatures. And I feel like that that is, like, potentially a really powerful effect. I agree. I, and I, I actually even remember somebody talking about... Uh, Somebody from Direwolf, like almost a year ago, talking about move like effects that move opponents' um, creatures. There were more. There were some of them in green in agility that they tested a long time ago, and and it just wasn't. They couldn't get the feel right, and it was too powerful and felt bad. I think that putting it on an item so it requires a little bit of setup. I think putting it in red. I think these are huge improvements over the idea of green spells, like we already see to move your own creatures. I, I think this is a well-designed card. It's it's funny you mention that because like then you look at like Ungalum the Listener and like uh, as you mentioned Tazcad like those are two of the cards that still got nerfed much right. later in the process so yeah you can tell like agility was one of the the significantly more powerful uh, classes absolutely during, like, development yeah did you have an opportunity to play any of the game during closed beta yeah I was actually I was in the alpha actually oh cool yeah because like I had to like you know have some more experience with it than most and um right right yeah like it was hard to actually keep up with changes because they haven't you know at that point they happen pretty frequently right that makes sense but yeah i mean like a lot of the game it's it's very similar to how it was and it's you know it's i, I think it's a great game i love i love the the depth that it has i agree and i'm still just looking over all the new cards to make sure that i'm not missing anything so I got a comment briefly on Dwarven Colossus, the 11-11 for 11. <laughs> yeah, I was actually thinking of hitting that. I'm like, what if you, in this neutral deck that we're playing, what if you hit that with Sails Through Storms? Hmm. Oh, that'd be beautiful. My my my. The heartbreaking part about this card for me is that the, uh, the power spheres that it summons are not Dwemer, right? Like, obviously you would play this in a Halls of the Dwemer deck, the support card that gives your Dwemer plus three, plus zero. Yeah. And like, oh my god, <laughs> right? Like, if this thing summoned three fives instead of zero fives, it would be incredible. Oh yeah, that's significantly better. I mean, right now, Dwemer decks, as far as just Dwemer go and not neutral cards in general, they, they top out at the seven cost, um, what is it, like a six, eight or something like that, that puts a spider data in your hand when you when it takes damage. Um, this is obviously like a, a new big end Dwemer for them. Yeah, 11, 11 for 11 is pretty big. 
Yeah. I mean, one of the things you have to remember is that in many ways, though, this is almost like an 1121 once you count the spheres. Um, right. The rumor is that the spheres are owned yeah. by the guards, and I think that that is something that is, I, I think, being overlooked a little too much. Like, the fact well, that's that... that's value, definitely. The fact that, like, when you compare this to, like, Iron Atronach, for example, Iron Atronach doesn't see a lot of play because there's a lot of ways to kill it, and one of the most annoying ways is, like, with a Fighter's Guild recruit or some other tiny creature with lethal, because it has guard and you can just crash right into Iron Atronach. This card, however, does not have guard and instead spawns other creatures that have guard. So you can hide it in the shadow lane yeah. and put bodies in front of it. So well, until that grappling hook comes out anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, but even if the grappling hook <laughs> comes out, they still have to deal with the guard in the other lane as well, right? So. Oh, the, that's true. Yeah, I yeah, guess. The, yeah. the hmm. guards are, I think, more relevant than people give it credit for. And yes, it can still just be piercing javelin, but you still get the 05 guards. So against like mid-range decks, so typically in Legends, control decks do really well against aggro, but can struggle against mid-range decks because they kind of like grind you out with value. But yeah. this, I think, would almost be like a better late game threat against other mid-range because they have to deal with your big guy and they have to deal with the guards. And if, if for whatever reason you don't have an answer, all it takes is those power spheres to give that bad boy like ward and drain and then you just lose, right? So... Yeah. One thing, I don't know if anyone else does this, but one thing I always do when I see, um, you know, when a card is epic, I always give it a little more thought. I'm like, well, why did you make this epic, right? Oh, I totally agree. The uh, From Heroes of Skyrim, the 3-2 in agility legendary creature that reduces a card's cost by one when you draw it, I could not figure out why this card was legendary, right? Like, it's such a straightforward card. The stats aren't, it's not overstatted. And the fact that it was legendary, like its rarity made me put that in so many decks to, you know, find out what I was missing. Yeah. And then like once you're like, yeah, it always makes me, yeah, it always makes me think that like they knew something that I didn't know. And I'm like, mm. what do you, what do you, what did you figure out in testing that made this legendary? Right. And maybe it could just be the fact that it's an 11-11 that puts two O fives into play, but you know, right. maybe not, I, maybe it's more. And even so, maybe it is that, that and that's good enough. And that's, that's a lot of that's a lot of stats for the cost. So. Right. Yeah, it's, it's worth considering too that in these uh, story expansions, the rarities, like I, as far as I can tell, their only purpose is to help balance arena. Yeah, I think Interest. that's fair. That would make sense. Yeah, that's also a consideration, definitely. Well, that ruins it. My bad, dude. But I mean, <laughs> like, it's still worth pointing out. <laughs> it's still worth pointing out because, like. Uh, you know, on its on the face of it, like an eleven eleven, like an eleven cost card in arena isn't necessarily something you're e even getting to play, right? So yeah, uh, it le leans cre leads some credence to what you guys are saying about the O fives being the real valuable part when you drop it and stuff like that. Yeah, and it's funny because how many cards are spoiled? Like twenty two out of fifty five. Right, we've seen like half of it. That's it. Like, yeah, less than half even. So there's still right. like three cards that we haven't seen yet, and it right. comes out in two weeks. Which is sweet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm definitely. excited. Yeah, same. Yeah, they, gonna... they did They did a similar thing with Follow the Dark Brotherhood where we didn't see the full list until I think it was legitimately the night before during our preview event, Justin. Because yeah, I, I, I remember signing in and immediately, that was the first thing I did on stream was we got access to the test server and I went right to the crafting section, turned on yeah. the set and was like, all right, what well, haven't we seen? Right. Because that's how we found yeah. Unstoppable Rage. Unstoppable Rage wasn't spoiled. Like, that was a, that was a Christmas right. present. I wonder if they knew it was going to be... have the interactions that it has. You know what I mean? Unstoppable Rage? Yeah. yeah like, whenever whenever there's a card that's, like, you know, very good in certain decks or, like, kind of, kind of makes its own archetype, really. Yeah. And it's not one of the spoiled cards, I wonder if that was because they missed it. I had this, I had a similar thought. I mean, there, there was a uh, you know a quick response from the community once, you know, twelve to twenty four hours had passed and people had gone from you know thirty to zero in a single turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you're like, what just happened? Right, and I think a lot of the confusion at first was that it wasn't uh, clear from the previous description of the keyword breakthrough how that would interact with yes. Unstoppable Ridge. Right, because again, that's the thing in a digital card game that it's not completely laid out for you. You don't have a, like a rule, like a comprehensive rules. Right. That are going to explain this to you. You kind of actually have to play with it and see how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I would, I personally would like to think that they 
they knew what they had and they purposefully kept it under wraps because there is something to be said about that uh, that moment when you're playing something new for the first time and like your opponent does something and you go what just happened like right. I, you know what I that's mean like because yeah. that's the kind like, of because card once that you, does that yeah and once you reveal it you have to actually explain the interaction as well yeah and not having to explain that and just letting people explore that themselves is like that's a great perk yeah, I agree. It, it, it's it's the kind of experience that you rarely have anymore in the days of the internet, right? Because like, you don't go home with a, your brand new packs of Ice Age, open them up with your friends, and, and you're like, like, I don't know what's in here. Right. There's no surprise anymore. Everything is ex, ex, you know extremely spoiled. You know how, and that's the thing. Also, like games like Hearthstone, where like you have a card like Kazakus, where it's like create a potion, right? And you're like, what does that mean? Right. So it's this cool little aspect of digital card games that you can you know, that you don't get out of physical card games because you know all of the components. Exactly. Yeah. And it's cool to, to create that experience for us. I yeah, mean, I've always said... It's an epic, too, and it's cost seven, so I feel like they knew something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and the name, in my opinion, kind of tips it off. I would like to think it's that in unstopped. development, it was named something else, and then a few people in Q&A probably flipped a table or two or broke a keyboard, and then they went like, no, this is, this is rage-inducing. Un- yeah, that's actually hilarious. I bet... That would be funny if that was actually part of the story. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> it, its playtest name was the like the endless mines of salt. <laughs> yeah. Yaka Yakaniku party in chat says, although to be fair, one advantage of a digital card game is you won't get ruled against by a dumb judge. And then he says, uh, cough Yu Gi Oh regionals cough, but I can tell you that I the most rage inducing ruling that I ever had for my, me personally was at a Magic Grand Prix where um, I I swung, a guy chose not to block, I played an instant for lethal. He called the judge over and said that uh, I never like gave him priority or whatever, and the judge basically said, like... I roll. Basically was like, well, I didn't see it, so back it up. And then like he stopped the action that I was swinging for lethal because now he knows it's coming, right? Right. So it was just like one of those, like, really, super you backed awkward. it up. Like, it was super awkward. And I was, I think, like, nine and two on the day. Like, I was really high and doing well. And it was the sort of thing yeah. where it was like the loss sucked. And then for my buddy Adam, who's like my other, he's like my MTG friendo that we go to the, the physical tournaments together, I, I watched a judge um get called for one of his games because not Adam didn't call him, this uh, opponent called him. And the first judge came over, and I wished I was joking. Uh, this was back during, um, what was that, Odyssey Block with the elephant tokens? But the judge basically ruled mm-hmm. that the elephant token wasn't a permanent, and I thought my buddy was going to flip a table. Yeah, that's not how that works. Yeah, he was right. like, cards are permanents, and that's a token. And I, th- I thought my buddy Adam was oh, going to lose his boy. shit. I don't know if I've told this story on the podcast before, but, uh, and Frank, I don't know if you know this, but, uh, I, I did some time in prison for drugs, right? Really? And, uh, I would yeah. not have known that. I mean, now I'm a counselor. I work at every entry, uh, nonprofit and I got my shit together, but that's um, awesome, man. So, not, uh, not the first part, but the second part. Well, hold on. <laughs> I'm, I'm bringing this up for some context because I got a similar story. Uh, I really got into magic in prison and people would mail us in paper uh descriptions of the text versions of all the cards and we cut out our own cards out of cardboard boxes and play magic that's that way. awesome well somebody sent in and you know so we were limited in terms of like what sets we could make our decks from but we we're all just playing you know the vintage basically somebody figured out um painter servant grindstone <laughs> 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 okay and uh so we're having one of the one of our tournaments and we interject uh, a prison is not the the place i would like to debut that combo no nah, dude no nah, you <laughs> that, you can imagine how this ends uh you know we have a guy who like played magic on the outside before you know he got locked up and he, he's uh like the judge and the the guy running the tournament and uh this guy pulls off the combo against this other dude and um he uh he's just like no way that that, no way that works like that no way it's bullshit (laughs) right you know like what the fuck man the judge comes over the judge guy i mean the other inmate comes over and he's like (laughs) like, man what is up with this what's up he's like no no that's how this works and he stabbed him pulled out his shank and stabbed the dude that happened what (laughs) stab the judge man stab the judge in my head, I'm like, oh, man, they're going to get real angry. 
Yeah. I didn't expect it to escalate that quickly. Well, I mean, uh, it's not. prison. Dude, I saw but, people get that, stabbed. Right, over... that's which is, yeah, that's why I was like, oh, this yeah. is gonna go this is gonna go poorly, because that is a I was making a joke because that's an infuriating interaction, but like oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. Wow. Dude, I saw that's people get stabbed playing Monopoly in prison. I mean well, like, yeah, this this one was a little more understandable. <laughs> but no, no, I'm gonna go with uh Monopoly will that like shot ruin... is right. <laughs> Monopoly will ruin families, like <laughs> I should have when I was at the PT. I should have flipped the table when when Luis got shot at me, and I should have stabbed him. That's a yeah. good idea. I I <laughs> I've never I've never been stabbed, but I thought I was going to get in a fist fight once at a yeah. regionals tournament. Um, I was playing uh, like a ramp death cloud deck in the standard format at the time. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I've told Justin this before several times. That, like one of my like cheeky quirks was that in any any time that I was in any sort of tournament where they were going to post deck lists if you performed well, my sideboard, regardless of the deck I ran or colors I had, always had one Might of the Oaks in it if it was allowed in the format. Mostly because I wanted somebody to see my posted deck list and go, why the hell was this guy running Might of the Oaks? And the answer was no reason. Like, it was just, I'll short my sideboard one card for fun. Yes. But I get in this matchup where... Uh, I like I just had a bunch of like useless cards and so like I boarded stuff out and I happened to also be running green at the time so I actually boarded in my one might of the oaks and we get down towards like this I mean it was a long match it was like game three um we were one of the last people still playing so like my friends are gathered around me because I had a, like a play test group with me and this dude that I'm playing against has like six of his buddies standing around him and I top deck Might of the Oaks, and so I swing with a Sakura Tribelder. He says no blocks, and I say Might of the Oaks, and he has no answer, and I win. And <laughs> it was like, it was like the real life version of like those gifts you see where everybody goes, oh, but it's all of his buddies like making fun of him. And I've never seen in person rage over a card game like that. Like, yeah, because it's like, why would you have that? Yeah, no, I mean, he was he was baffled, like because. You know, it's just not the sort of thing that you expect. And certainly, like, I was no, doing No, no one's well. playing around Might of the... Like, yeah. Plus seven, plus seven. Yeah, nobody does, but it was just one of those things. And I, I can guarantee you... <laughs> no one you, expects Might of the Oaks. I can absolutely 100% <laughs> guarantee you that if we had been in prison, I would have been stabbed. Like, the, the level of rage in this guy's face was oh, yeah. very apparent this is and it an did, not, murdered situation. did not help yes. that all of his friends were there to witness it because now like it's one of those like you can't live it down it's not like oh, yeah, oh no, i just has, lost yeah, like you tell your buddies like you know oh it's bullshit i got a bad beat or whatever no everybody saw it which what art was it was it the squirrel art yes always the squirrel art perfect yeah. see now they have hey man remember that remember that time you got plus seven plus seven with a squirrel yeah yeah no it's always the squirrel that was back when in the core set they had changed the art to like the dude dual wielding tree trunks or whatever but i always no. ran squirrel it's 100 percent squirrel <laughs> yeah did the stabbed guy die someone asked in chat oh no they did not die no oh thank well it, thank goodness it wasn't murder it was just uh yeah, yeah. i mean he no, died no, he the, the stabber didn't even get in trouble, man. Yeah. Like you can't rat somebody out for that sort yeah. of thing. Well, also, once you once you explain to the like the the guards that you know he played yeah. grindstone and um, yeah, they totally understood. Painter servant, they were like, we got it. Yeah. say no more. Say no more. Absolutely. No. That's unbelievable to me, man. Yeah. Wow. So back on the topic, I was going to mention that uh, Soldier Ron said I'm personally not wowed by any of the real cards. I'm hoping they didn't reveal the best cards. Um, so about that, like. It's, I think it's okay to not be wowed by all the spoilers because I don't I think one of the best parts is not the cards that you're like wow this is amazing it blows me away but there's a lot of like filler cards which are great and not filler as in like we use this to just fill in the set but like cards that already can find a home in existing decks that maybe yeah. or like maybe decks that don't exist yet that just need a little bit of, of, of a push yeah. can put in them and I think that's super cool like I think a lot of it's like that's like your bread and butter of sets I think yeah I agree I mean, like, there are a couple cards that inspire me to do new things, uh, but for the most part, they're cards that are supporting archetypes that aren't Tier 1 yet. Yeah, I, for me, what I would say is that whoever scheduled these, um, I think, are doing a much better job of, like, figuring out what to spoil and when uh, this time around versus in the past, because for a large number of cards on this list, I would say that these cards look like not bad but not great but have the potential to be great depending on what else in, is in the set right i look at cards like assembled titan which 
could be really good depending on you know how many other factotums we have and what they do. I look at mm -hmm. cards like the treasure hunt cards and treasure map. Depending on what's available, those could end up being really good. We just don't have enough info, and so the stuff that has been spoiled to me doesn't wow me yet, but certainly has piqued my interest in the other cards because they could be really good. Yeah, I also, agree. um, Messinar? Is it Messinar or Mechanar? What do you think? Uh, Probably depends what part of the country you're from. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. You know, the four, 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 eight. You stitch together the top creatures from both both decks. Yeah, like that's just a cool ability, and I kind of want to see how that works. Like, you could have like a four <laughs> that draws you a card, right? So, yeah. but it could be a really big card. Yeah, we uh, so last week we had Pete Hines on the show, and we were talking to him about really dumb things that you could combine with Mechanar. Yeah. We uh, we've got so far as to find a way to put a sweet roll into our deck, <laughs> so that we could combine a sweet roll with uh, you know the dream is the sweet roll plus the Odaving or something like that, so you can kill. Wow. Them. Yeah. Yeah. But Mechanar is fascinating. That's the way they went, and I, of course, because as uh, was charged earlier in the podcast, I'm an asshole. Uh, I was immediately thinking about uh, bog lurchers and uh, minotaurs because nothing says amazing like you know twelve four breakthrough charge creatures for four magica. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, we're like, well, how does the what does the cost end up being? How does that work? Did he explain how that works? Yeah, it's the cost of the more expensive of the two creatures. You uh, so like uh, you reveal the top car top creature of your deck, top creature of the opponent's deck. The cost of the new creature is going to be whichever is more expensive. It's going to add the attack and the defense of the creatures together, and then you get to choose one of the creatures' text box. Like this could put some really strong things together. Absolutely. I mean, this is going to be like I. I when when it was just the core set, I kind of said that there weren't a lot of like uh, highlight real moment cards yeah, in this Legends. Is one. This is one of those kinds of cards. <laughs> I love digital card games. Is that like there are it's it's totally possible to have a lot of those. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I, excited about this. I'm also really excited. Some people have already kind of keyed in on this, but I'm curious to see what this does in like Blink Mage that uh, is control focused because it does regardless of what happens it does take the top creature of your opponent's deck when it creates the stitching so if you mm -hmm. play him and then you continue to dark rebirth him or night to remember him it keeps going further and further down your opponent's deck always taking the top creature so you could make it so that they're not drawing a creature for like you know five right. six seven turns and just lock them out of a game i mean like i've been thinking about dumb things to do with this card and uh, I'm leaning right now towards Mechanar plus uh, three Nord Firebrands in my deck and no other creatures and a bunch of removal spells and then just seeing what I can get. <laughs> That's what I was thinking as well. Like there's a way it almost makes me want to like only put specific creatures in my deck. Right. That I want to be able to hit with like Sails Through Storms or, or yeah. Mechanar and you're like, well, if I only put Odavings in my deck, I'll always hit Odaving, right? Right. <laughs> It's worth it's worth doing. Uh, Charmer and I kind of uh, kicked off a format um, about nine months ago where we played a series of duels with decks without any creatures in them, and uh, it was an opportunity to play a lot of uh, stuff that doesn't see a lot of play. Certainly, yeah. an opportunity to play combos that don't you have an opportunity Especially to play. Find things to fill those holes with. No, right. It was an opportunity for Justin to flip a coin and be an asshole. Calling Hold me, on. calling me an asshole. That dude brought flesh sculpture in like every deck he played. <laughs> that that is bullshit. That's definitely prison rules. <laughs> well, Needless I didn't say that. So that's good. Yeah, that's true. Needless to say, I won all those games. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have since changed the format so flesh sculpture is banned. But uh, it's a really cool thing to do and. What, what I sort of bring this up is because it's worth pointing out that until today, every card revealed from the set had been a creature or an item. We had our very first spell today, mm -hmm. very first action in Reverberating Strike. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. We've also seen no supports as of yet, and I'm sure that we'll get at least one. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I'm hoping for something in the... You know, in the in the same vein as Altar of Despair, a neutral card that encourages people to build a new deck around it. Yeah, that's the best. Like, whenever a new deck can actually just uh, be formed based on new cards, it's just awesome. 
Yeah. Or even if it doesn't have to be a completely new deck, it can be a deck that was just on the cusp that just gets the, the slight bump it needs from the new set. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, sort of like uh, a number of cards have been... Re- like, orcs were a thing closed beta, and then nobody played them until, like, this spring, um, because over time, a few cards were released that made orcs playable, made orcs good enough, um, despite the fact that those cards always existed. I'm really looking forward to seeing what gets that extra nudge. I mean, there's the obvious one, right? Like, uh, just the Dwemer decks. The Fabricants alone are reason enough to try it out, and I'm really excited about it. Because, like, sort of like we talked about last week, uh, the Dwemer are the 11th class in the game, you know? Yeah, that's interesting, because uh, that wasn't the case up until, I think, this set, really. Yeah. Yeah, there wasn't... Like, it was a meme thing. You could play it, yeah. like, you weren't, you weren't going to win. <laughs> I've got yeah, right. Basically, yeah. You're like, I'm playing the cool Halls of the Dwimmer deck, but okay, cool. Well, thanks right. for the win. But I mean, your yeah. deck, the deck's cool. I wrote yeah. about it for one of the articles on uh, Bethesda, but right. You know, it's it's missing things. It's definitely it's not there yet. You know. Right. Yeah, I've got a strong interest in seeing what the other fact totems are because just based on what I've seen so far, I, I desperately want to try fact totem control. I don't know what class yet, like what colors you're pairing it with, but. I really think that the idea of like this inevitability of every time I play something, even if it's my cheap guys, it's going up in value, going up in value. I think that that's the kind of grindy control deck that would certainly appeal to me. So I want to see some more. Yeah, and Assembled Titan is just a bonkersly powerful card if it has the you know the correct number of Factotum to run alongside it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's versatile. It's a super versatile card. Yeah. Why is it? Why is it unique? Why can't we assemble more than one Titan? I know that is so heartbreaking about that card. That is the high Rothgar of the set, I think. <laughs> oh, you're a robot. Yeah, they're expensive. I I, I guess I guess that's fair. Sure. I suspect <laughs> I can't argue with that. I suspect that one's unique because that's going to be the only one that has gained life on it, and that's the real appeal. Because if you're playing control and you make it so that every one of your fact totems for the rest of the game gains you health, that's like a crazy safety net for stabilizing. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's fair. Need some changelings. (laughs) Hey, no, that was teased. That was teased. I I forgot about that, actually. You're right, Dylan. Yeah, we don't know what. We spent a couple hours trying to get Pete to slip up and reveal some stuff that hadn't been revealed yet. And he he let out that there is a creature that has a versatile creature type in this set. Yeah, he described it as like shape-shifty or something like that, but he wouldn't go further. Yeah. Pete's Pete's good. Pete's good about not not getting given too much info. Yeah, you should you should have heard Charmer ask him in a ba- in a really roundabout stealthy way about Elder Scrolls Six. <laughs> oh my God! See, uh, yeah, well, I mean, dude, you, like it's funny because he gets that question constantly. Right. Like uh, he can't actually post on Twitter about anything without people being like, "Yeah, well, what about what about the next Elder Scrolls?" Yeah. yeah. No, I. All right, I, I actually yeah. told Justin before he was on our show that like. I had this deep seated fear that our chat was gonna literally just be all night long. Yeah. Every, yeah. yeah. Everybody like when is Elder Scrolls Six? Like. Yeah. It'll get here when it gets here. And it's like, bro, you know, we have like six other franchises that we deal with. Right. Yeah. And let's let's keep it real here. Like, I've put three hundred hours in Skyrim. I have not finished that game. <laughs> I just literally started playing Fallout Four again like two days yeah. ago, three days ago, and I'm like, wow, this is so much more that I haven't done. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and they just remastered Skyrim. And going, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, even going a step further than that, like, this is why I'm okay with waiting. Like, do I want it tomorrow but shitty, or do I want to just trust that they're going to do it right? Right. You know? I'll yeah. wait. Like, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. Absolutely. Also, Pete, when's Fallout 5 getting here, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the meantime, we can all play Hello Kitty Island Adventure. I... <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, so I gotta ask... It's, it's been something I've been waiting to ask all night. What's the dog's name? Oh, he's Hunter. Because he's a good boy. Oh, yeah, he's wonderful. I'm a, yeah, he's, I'm a he's big a good dog dude. guy. Oh, same. Yeah, he's he's the best. He's a uh, Greyhound Pointer mix, and uh, he never stops moving. Oh, see, I am uh, I'm the owner of a Grumble of Pugs. 
So three or more pugs <laughs> is called a grumble, in case you nice. wanted Good to know. Nice. You know, he's chasing um, his tail. And my my specific like the one that like follows me everywhere. His name is Oi, after uh, the Dark Tower series, and he doesn't move ever. He's the exact opposite. Like he. Unless unless I make him move, he's basically stationary. Now he's, I'm always like, why do you still have energy? I don't understand. It's two a.m. and yeah. it never stops. I have a cat. He's a good dude, though. He's like he's a loyal. He's a. Lo <laughs> I also have a cat, but he's less, uh, less camera friendly. Yeah. Yeah. Justin's cat hasn't been on the cast yet tonight. What's up with that? I don't know. She must be busy somewhere. Usually, the, the cat howls around ten o'clock local time for me. Yeah. I'm in De I'm in Denver. Um, but uh, she's been conspicuously absent, so I presume she's destroying something somewhere. <laughs> I I would also have that feeling. Yeah. 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 Weather's actually great. Like I opened my window for the first time today. I just I I, I felt it as you were as as we were finishing that up. So I was like, oh, I'm going to mention this because it's super yeah. nice out right now. Absolutely. Where where are you at? Right now I'm in Florida. Okay, cool. cool. So it's like it's like at that point where it's like, let me see what, what the temperature actually is outside because it's not often this uh this cool. It's fifty nine right now, which is unbelievable to me. Wow. But it is it is nice. Like window open weather, so nice. Yeah. We we had a surprisingly warm day here, but I mean I know we're in you know in for some snow soon. It's already yeah. snowed several times this year, so. <laughs> really? Yep. What is yep. surprisingly warm for you? Uh, it was about 55, which was comfortable. Okay, that's oh, nice, yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, I can deal with that. Yeah. Yeah, it was like, it was warm here for this time of year, and I think it was like 30s or 40s or something. Like, it was like sleeting off and on, but. <laughs> we get that lake it's, effect so every time you describe michigan it's just like it's like one of the provinces of hell <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing there is like three weeks out of the year where michigan is maybe the most beautiful place on the planet and then yeah. other than that it is torture like i swear it's yeah. so miserable that's sucks, it's, man. it's finally a snowy day in russia nice nice <laughs> Yeah, like it's weird. Like it feels like it's coming later. For like, it feels like what is it? November? I don't know. Like I have no track of like when when climates change because in Florida we just don't have climates. Like we just have That's hot, hot, right? Like there's no snow. There's no. We don't have a fall. Like seasons doesn't change. Right. Trees don't like change color. So. Well, the good news about living here in Denver is that <clears throat> by the end of the century, I'll have some beautiful uh, oceanfront property. <laughs> 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 I mean. Same, I think. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh no, I'll be underwater then. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's different. You're. You'll I'm be... surprised you're not underwater now. Yeah, I got for... a little bit of time. I got probably got a couple of years. Be living on a giant tanker ship with a crazy guy with one eye getting attacked by. I Kevin was, I was yeah. just getting ready to say. <laughs> I think I've seen a documentary about Florida. Wasn't it oh, called Waterworld? Oh yeah. my god. I mean, like, I don't know, man. I've been to Florida. It's a few funny because it's true. And those people on that boat, man. Those are the people I met in Florida. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, they're all Florida man. Like, yeah. <laughs> I I routinely say that Florida is the craziest state in the union. It is yeah. to the United States not... what Australia is to the world. And you're routine. You're routinely correct as well. Growing up, I used to listen to a lot of Love Line, the uh, the radio show with Adam and Doctor Drew, mm -hmm. and um, they played a game on there back in the late '90s, I think, called Germany or Florida. Yep, that's we, still we, a thing. People call it these insane stories about some bizarre macabre sexual behavior, and you'd have to guess which bizarre macabre's oversexualized location is, is was responsible yeah. for it. Hmm, is this Germany or Florida? Right. Oh, it's always Florida. Yeah, it's always Florida. It really is. I'm like, oh, someone ate someone's face on bath salts. Yeah. Come on, not Florida, not Florida, right. not Florida, hey, and it hey, always is. A sinkhole yeah. swallowed a house. Hey, look, it's Florida. Like. Yeah, Absolutely. it could be a different state. Uh, never, it's never a different state. JT Graphic writes that they still do Germany or Florida on the Adam Carolla show. That's awesome. <laughs> Glad someone's keeping it alive. And it's probably yeah. always still Florida. Yeah, usually. Like, don't get me wrong. We have some crazy headlines that'll air for like Detroit out here, but all of ours are just sad and not like the Florida ones are like you scratch your head. Out here, they're just sad. 
Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like, yeah. Here, here, it's like okay, I can laugh at this. Yeah. yeah there, it's just dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If a crocodile eats somebody in Detroit, it's because that was their gang name. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> <laughs> crocodiles. <laughs> Good times. Oh God. Also, we have alligators, buddy, not crocodiles. Oh. Well, um, don't you have both because you import exotic animals from everywhere? Like, the last time I was in Florida, I was driving on a back road, and there was literally somebody who had, like, a tiger in a cage on a country road. Yeah, I remember that. Or I, I think I know what you're talking about. I don't think that's terribly common, but I know, I know, I think I know the one you're talking about. It's like a truck stop. No, this Unless was like you're some, talking about no, a little person. This was, like, somebody's house outside of Kissimmee in a rural area. If that tells you anything. <laughs> Florida, why you gotta be letting people down like this? Oh. Yeah, alligators, someone said alligators are wild in Florida. Like, they are crazy everywhere. Like, yeah. Hmm. Like, you can drive by, a, like, a lake in your neighborhood and be like, there's probably alligators in there. Do you, uh, do you ever buy boiled peanuts from guys on the side of the road? I never do. <laughs> yeah, I did that while I was there. That was good. That's so. funny, because it's one of those things that, like, if you live here, you don't do it, you know? Because yeah, it's yeah. like, eh. Yeah, like I just go to Chick Fil A and Chipotle, and that's that's you know I don't really go out of the yeah, out of the normal kind, stuff. So. Kind of like smoking weed here in Denver. <laughs> right, exactly. You're like it's not it's not a big deal anymore. Like once right. it's, once it's normalized, like right. Eh. I agree. Like it's same thing. Before this, I was in Seattle for a couple of years, and um, okay. it was super weird because like I don't even I don't even smoke, but like it's so surreal when you're driving down the highway and there's like just signs for weed stores, like yeah. big, huge billboards. And you're like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, dude. Every day I drive past, uh, to get to work, I have to drive past uh dispensary, uh, dispensary's warehouse. And, uh, right across the main highway that cuts right through Denver, you smell pot. Yeah. And it's so weird. Cause it's like, what a, wow. 2017, man. So legitimately in the city that I live in, um, they only allowed dispensaries for medicinal use, but there was a city ordinance uh, three or four years ago that like set the initial standards for what you had to do to become a medicinal dispensary, right? But there was no like additional regulation, so they just sprouted up around my city, and like we had one of the densest like per capita period, like literally like the the city i'm in is uh the capital it's lansing right and it is not necessarily a small city but not a large city but it, they were like on every street corner and they just like literally like a month ago just reworked some of the city ordinances to try to scale back but they're still like in the hundreds for my city like i can i can walk like two blocks from my house in any direction and find dispensaries yeah. and it it's was not even like, like statewide legal you know, probably not that many, but in Seattle, like literally every five minutes you drive, you're going to find one. Yeah, wow. it's crazy. Like they popped up like crazy. And I don't know what it was like for you in Seattle, but around here, they're the sketchiest buildings. Oh, they, they, um, it's really it's really nice here. It's hit or right. miss. Like some are really nice and yeah. then some are just like like a little like a literal shack. Right. But they look bad on the outside. And then once you get on the inside. There's like the door that you have to go through, like it's locked and then they have to like buzz you in. And yeah. then when you get in there and like, it's really nice and it's all laid out and like, it's got like nice wood. And like, i like, I went to a couple of them because I have friends that smoke and I was like, I'll just go with you because whatever cool experience. But like, it's funny when you go in there. Cause you're like, this is like a high end. It's like an electronic store, but for, for weed. And you're like, wow, this is crazy. Like, like the sharper image stores 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. It's like the sharper image store, <laughs> but for weed. And yeah. Like, what a weird concept. Like, I'm surprised this is so high end. Yeah, it's weird because except for the ones that are by the local university campus, that is not the experience here. Like, they are the shadiest, like, I've been uh, in, like, really sketchy taco shops that probably couldn't pass health code stuff that were in better shape than some of these dispensaries. And, like, other ones are very clearly, like, biker gangs that just also were like, oh, by the way, we also sell pot and... <laughs> It's uh, it's something else. Yeah, it's weird. It's a weird feeling, especially because like this was an unheard of three years ago, you know? Like it's just something that popped up so quickly. I uh, So I sobered up while I was locked up and I, I've been clean now for quite a few years. And uh, so I've never bought legal weed. 
And but I, I wonder sometimes, you know, like how somebody who's just turning twenty one or whatever the age is to buy it, like how much different that experience is from the one that we had, you know, buying from the skeevy guy in the corner. <laughs> right. It's a completely different experience now. Right. But like you hear of all these success stories about the cities who have legalized it having yeah. like this excess of tax money and it's insane. Right. Yeah, actually, um, that's part, part of the part of that money f- goes to fund uh, nonprofits like the one I work at. And a lot of it gets put back into uh, state run rehab programs. So, I mean, we're making good use of it here. Yeah, I mean, that's like that's like the best case scenario, I think. Right. Like, not only is it not contributing to like a gateway drug usage, but it's also literally helping the people who are having problems with it currently, you know? Right, exactly. Because, I mean, you know, the bottom line is that for every 20 people, 25 people who get high, like only like maybe one of them is going to be the kind of guy who's like, well, now I got to do this every day for the rest of my life. And I don't even think it's because, yeah, and I don't even, right, exactly. And I think that we're going to find something to do anyway. Of course, of course. I'd rather it be weed than something much worse. Right. Yeah, and the fact that for that one guy, you know, there is uh, more treatment available because of the fact that the 19 guys yeah. are enjoying it responsibly. I mean, that's just win-win. I agree. This is I a- say that as somebody who was that one guy. <laughs> <laughs> I speak from experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is funny because, like, this is a... Welcome to an Elder Scrolls Legends podcast, guys. Yeah, right? <laughs> Dude, this is what it turns we've covered, into every week. We've every the week. Gamut, though. It's like 10 minutes of Elder Scrolls and then like yeah. prison time. And... As long as people are used to that and that's that's totally cool, then that's an awesome, like, I like the freedom there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, we had been talking about doing a podcast for like a, maybe a year now almost even. I don't know. And uh, we At just finally got off our asses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, it's we're big fans of, of the game and yeah. Yeah, and I like actually I I love grassroots content like that just making stuff because you like the game, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of like what like uh why Charmer and I be, you know, became friends is because we're both really happy with our lives doing things uh outside of gaming and we do this right. as a hobby, you know, and and uh we have an equal amount of almost no time to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely lean on each other a lot because both of us have pretty packed schedules. Because uh, right. we're also like we're both idealists, and we try to make the world better during right. during the day. So, right. I just try to make some game content during the day, so I am less. Well, I, I'm probably less con- contrib- contrib- contributing less. I guess we'll say contributional. I'm like, there's no word for that. So I contribute less to the uh, the the, imbe- the betterment of the world. I would say, but. I wouldn't say that's necessarily true. I mean, I feel like, especially in the last like five or six years, uh, the internet and gaming has has started to sprout up these like really deep communities that a lot of people who yeah, maybe otherwise w- wouldn't have a chance to bond over anything. You know, not like people who missed out on that sports experience growing up are getting that experience now as adults, and I think that's a really empowering thing. Yeah, I agree with you, and uh, it's funny because I I think about it constantly about like if you know if I if I told my mom like. 20 years ago when I was a kid, like, Hey, when I grow up, I'm going to be playing video games and people are going to watch me and I'm going to do that for a living. Like, yeah, no, they, she would laugh at my laugh in my face. Yeah. When I was a kid, I told my parents I wanted to be a drug dealer and they laughed at me. <laughs> <laughs> now who's laughing mom? Yeah. Right? <laughs> I mean, for, for a while we, we were all laughing. <laughs> I mean, you just got to live that dream, man. I mean, to be, to be fair, you did turn it into a career, though. That was just your entry-level position, right? Like that's, you had, that's true. Right. That's you true. had to do that to do the other part. That's just a rite of passage, man. That's right. That was just one of those things. <laughs> if you never did that, I don't know if you'd be here. So, uh, so, so Some people attend high school. Some people... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all institutions, man. Either way. That's right. It's I, just I'm one not gonna, institution I'm... or another. Not gonna let the man tell me what to do. <laughs> I I think that's a good way to look at it. That's that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, dude. Uh, rock right. on. So, um, we're way overdue. Should we take some questions? I mean, we've been answering as we go, so I guess there's not like an official formal start, but open it up. Yeah. If people have questions sure. for Frank or anything else. If you guys want to talk about Bitcoin being on the rise, whether or not that's a bubble. I've seen a lot of news about that today. 
I, Dude, I bought some Bitcoin about a month ago. So um, if you guys want to, uh, God, you guys talk about contributing nothing to society. If, <laughs> if, Holy shit! <laughs> I was like, Bitcoin going up. I'm in. All right. Uh, I don't. I don't know why you're against that, Justin. It's uh, it's not something that's going to be control. Like the reason that people keep fighting Bitcoin and the reason it gets the negative press that it does is because. Like, let's yeah. be honest, the banks want to control all of the electronic, yeah. you know, exchange, right? Like, they want you to use your credit cards and that to be the standard, and yeah, that's because they have control over it. They make money on it, so. Yeah, no, I mean, I, in principle, I agree with you, but, like, if you're kidding yourself if you think that Bitcoin's not going to eventually be controlled by some sort of hegemonic corporation at best, <laughs> or a rogue nation state at worst. <laughs> Um, someone said, how do you feel about fake online money? Like, so the thing about that is I actually have a really strong <laughs> opinion about this and I, and I try to exercise it regularly. Everything is fake online stuff. Now elder scrolls legends, which is, uh, you know, the game that we're probably basing this podcast on is, is a fake <laughs> online card game. Uh, the movies you watch on Netflix are fake online movies. Like the, the, the music on Pandora and Spotify is fake online music. Everything is fake. Like I don't think just being digital means that it's fake because otherwise the money in your bank right now is fake. It's fake online money. That's you know, true. like, like you don't own it. Like if you go and you can, you can get it. Um, you can withdraw it, but there's situations where they might not even have it. Right. Like that's a real thing. And, um, no, like, that's true. You know, there's, there's, people have this association with, uh, how tangible physically tangible something is. Uh, determines its realness and i just think we're we have to get away from that because literally everything you consume is fake and digital right now yeah yeah that's true i I would even go a step further and say like like let's be honest what's the relevancy of the paper or coin money anyway period right like it's really just assigning a monet you know some sort of value right to currency for exchange of services and blah 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 like to me it doesn't matter whether it's you know, fucking bottles of piss, you know, like I carried cash around for years. Like I've just, yeah. I never, I rarely have a dollar in my wallet cause I don't have to, like, there's no, there's no reason to have that, you know, same here. I agree. And like there were, this would happen all, all the time when I was, I would be playing magic online and people are like, well, I want to get into magic online cause I don't want to pay for fake cards. And I'm like, well, what's your definition? Of, what's the realness of the card for you? Because Right. I play more magic online with the cards like with my fake cards than I play real magic with my real cards. They take up less room in my house. I don't yeah. have boxes over boxes like that I have to store and keep track of and sort. Yep. Like yeah. the the value of of having fake online cards is so much higher to me <laughs> than having physical cards and then having to find something to play with and taking them to your house and it's just a whole thing. Like I I would say I I was going to say, I would say buying fake online magic cards is like buying stocks, except for you get to play with them. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, like, it's just, I don't, I don't consider a movie on Netflix, a fake online movie, just because I don't hold the DVD in my hand. Like that doesn't make any sense. As long as you're getting the value out of this object that, uh, that's that you're, that you're meant to, I think it's, who cares whether it's physical or digital. I totally agree. But it's just this weird, like, this. these people have a weird stigma, like, if they can't hold it in their hand, it's not safe, right? They don't have it. And I think we're slowly getting past that, but it's just, I, we're not there yet, so. I agree. All right, uh, our, a goat in a boat says, do you think we'll get some more Shackle interactions in the next expansion? Shackle is a good example of something we were talking about, which is uh, decks that don't quite have all the necessary tools yet. I mean, Shackle's a great ability. It is, is, but I think he's talking about more like Drez Tormentor type effects that encourage you to just smash well, Shackle like everything. A, like, so, right, like uh, Shackle's Matters abilities, you would say. Yeah. Exactly. I would like to see... Uh, well, one, I, I we know we're getting at least a couple more Shackle cards, but whether or not we get things that have a synergy with the effect itself, I don't know. But I would like to personally see more things like Drez Tormentor, but with different triggers. Like, I would love a, you know, when you shackle an enemy creature, gain two life. Or, you know, do one, you know, damage to blah blah blah. Or this creature gets bored whenever you shackle an opposing creature. Or, you know what I mean? Like, I just want to see more things trigger off of you shackling. I can see that. 
also like usually when you have uh, something like that, that's something that's kind of narrow, but like specific, usually they'll put like one of those in every set, right? Like, so you're never going to get like a huge influx of those cards. They'll be like, let's throw a Shackles Matter card in this set, you know? And then eventually it adds up to a, maybe you'll have a whole deck of like Dress Tormentors, you know, where they can all do something when, when against Shackled creatures. But, right. you know, I mean, I, I think the most you'd probably see in a set like this, especially because it's a smaller expansion, is like one. I agree. Uh, Zombie Hunter 9 by 19 asks, here's a question, and it looks like it's going to be a question you can answer, Frank. What do you think about a magic deck that can routinely trigger Arayo Soratami Ascendant in one turn and play Arcane Laboratory on the next turn? <laughs> uh, I think it's probably uh, created by monsters. Yeah. And uh, they probably don't have many friends, I would imagine. Do you want, do you want me to call up the guy who stabs over magic? <laughs> I think that's, I think his services are needed once, once more. That makes sense. That makes sense. You're needed, sir. Yeah. So it's worth noting, uh, we are currently being raided by another Legends streamer, Lady Devon. She actually streams a ton of Bethesda content. Um, she's one of the people on my auto host list, and she's fantastic. But hello and welcome to all of Lady Devon's viewers, if you're not familiar. Uh, this is a weekly podcast that Justin and I do, and we have a special guest this week in Frank Lepore. So hello and welcome. Also, uh, eight and eight and done in the chat said butt touching, and uh, yeah, that's I think that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I hope that they actually buff <laughs> butt touching, um, but you don't think butt touching is OP right now? I was well, gonna say, man, butt touching is everywhere lately. I was gonna say, you been watching the news? I think, I think we need a nerf butt touching. <laughs> no, no, now. I was yeah. gonna say, I was gonna say they need to buff butt touching, but they need to only buff the consensual kind. And they need to nerf. Oh. They need to nerf the enemy interactions, right? Like when your own stuff oh, butt touches, <laughs> you're good. But don't don't butt touch my stuff is what I'm trying yeah, to say. Yeah, that's right? good. I like that. Yeah, you can't you can't target an opponent's butts. Yeah, I, I think, think we should. Good. I think we should just assume that all butts that aren't living with you uh, in a consensual relationship have ward. <laughs> oh, I. Lo- Hexproof. There we go. Or, or oh, you, this is the best, man. You could yeah. just assume that they have warts. Usually, that's what it does. You know, for me, I just go, yeah, that one's probably infested. I'll stay away. Yeah, it's just that's how. Yeah. 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 It's got lethal. It's got lethal. <laughs> it's got lethal. I, yeah. You no, know, that's it. Has to have an infested warts. Is is that's right. really the keep away? Yeah. Good talk. So uh, there was somebody did ask, uh, and I'm curious what. Frank would say to this. Um, the okay. question was, do you guys consider uh, there is one card that needs rebalancing or looked at? So I think they're trying to say, do you think that there is, you know, it, you know, if you had one card that you would want to be either rebalanced or looked at, what would it be? Hmm. I mean, is, is Swamp still OP? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Island is OP. <laughs> Island has always been OP. Oh, no, I mean, like, no, three mana, what's it called? I can't think of the name right now. Oh, Hisgrove, yeah. Yeah, Hisgrove. Uh, I mean, like, Hisgrove's interesting, right? Because I sort of blame the decks that Hisgrove supports for the meta full of charge creatures. <laughs> interesting. I don't yeah. think the Hisgrove is overpowered, but... Hmm. Hmm. Hisgrove does a good job of making... We're not talking about Hearthstone, or uh, Elder Scrolls Legends, right? We're not talking about magic right now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The question, brother. I can't think of anything that's, like, really where I'm like, oh my god, this card is so oppressive, like, it's it's everywhere, like... Yeah, I, I would tend to agree. I mean, I think that some of the most powerful cards in the game are cards like Parthenax, um, Unstoppable Rage, as far as cards that see a lot of play, but I don't think any of them are overpowered. Right, like I just feel like they're they're on point, like uh, seven mana. You know, it's like all these cards are good, yeah. But I'm never like, wow, this is I'm, I can't deal with this, or it comes down too early, or anything like yeah. that. Like it seems fine. I think that the the card I'm most concerned about in the future is Swindler's Market. I mean, I I feel like Swindler's Market is a card who's. I mean, every time you print a zero cost zero cost card, the card theoretically becomes more dangerous. Um, and uh, I I mean. With the right draw, you can beat anything with a Swindler's Market deck. That's the card I'm most concerned about going forward. I can see that, but I think that that's one of the reasons why we just got the monthly card that we did, right? Because they were trying to give us additional tools 
in yeah. a more like reasonable timeline for dealing with it. For for me, and like this says a lot coming from the guy who lives and breathes, you know, Charge Crusader. Um, right. I uh, honestly and truthfully like the feel monster like, you are. Yeah, I know. Uh, I really feel like that Ulfric's house Carl needs to be a three three. Um, the reason that I say that is because the things that it accomplishes is uh, too much on the turn that you play it, in my opinion, because you're typically, you know, you're starting with either a one drop if you got it, but if not, a quality two drop, a quality three drop, and by the time you're playing it on four, you're usually in a position where you're getting ready to crack at least one rune, potentially two. So you're getting a body with one to two cards, but then the to me the big thing is that it has four health. So it dodges only, crushing blow. It dodges. It's going to dodge the new. Uh, right. Yeah. So not only does it dodge crushing blow, but it, the big one to me is it dodges ice storm. Like in the past, the, the yeah. way you would combat aggressive decks is like, yeah, they get out ahead of you, but then you know you you wipe them out once you get to ice storm, and then you try to stabilize, and they try to fight you with whatever hand they have left. But with yeah. Ulfric's house, Carl you not only refill your hand with cards to combat one half of what Ice Storm was doing to you, but you're also left with a body on the board to keep pushing damage and keep drawing more cards. So I really feel yeah. like just nerfing it to a 3-3 would be enough to bring it more in line. Yeah. Lady Devon uh, actually said, uh, I ran into a card tonight that I want to be only one per deck. It was an 8-8 <laughs> that when they had 18 Magicka became super buffed. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, obviously pure, pure, pure Blood Elder. Right, which is pretty funny. Uh, that's a card that I was—I uh, I didn't think was going to be super powerful. Um, I've enjoyed playing a handful of times, uh, but not one I'm particularly worried about. It's funny because when I saw that card, I was like, "Oh my god, this is ridiculous!" Yeah, yeah. Because and like, but it's funny because there's certain cards that look insanely powerful, right? But they don't work out all the time, you know? Yeah, I like, agree. You have to, like having 18 or more max magic is a lot to ask. <clears throat> right. And while Legends certainly affords you the opportunity to get to 18 Magico before you win, <laughs> like I feel like the effort you put into getting to 18 Magico without losing could have been spent getting to 18 Magica and winning. Right. Yeah, I agree. Still Long I mean good. It's it's strong when you get it. Like it's I it's agree. A big it's a big big lady. She's a big girl. She's she's she's, she's thick. <laughs> She is. Uh, the Long Afternoon mentions uh, Goblin Skulk, which I agree is maybe a top 10 most powerful card in the game. Um, yeah, that card's a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah, it's a card that annoying. my it's, opponent always has on turn two. Yeah, it's the best two drop in the game, period. Like, Definitely. I, I won't take any other argument. It just is. Yeah. Uh, however, I don't think it's... I don't know. I wouldn't mind it rotating out but i don't think it needs to be changed that's also interesting the the rotation conversation where like do they have should they have a format like right. wild and, and hearthstone where you right. rotate cards often or like you can retire them to the hall of fame you know yeah i think it's inevitable like you said earlier um you have to cards like the more cards you have the more broken interactions are possible so you have to actually right. put a limit on the amount of of cards that are in a given format of course. Ozymandias. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times it is turn one, bro. <laughs> yeah. So one of the follow-up questions to the like balance adjustment nerf was, you know, if you could pick one card to buff, what would you like to see get just a little bit more help? Hmm. I saw that. I couldn't think of anything. Hmm. But if I tried. Yeah. Tons of cards. Like, there's tons of cards that I look at, and I'm like, this card's super cool, but it's not good enough. Yeah. So, like, to think of off the top of my head is not super easy because that's most cards that are not in right. competitive decks, I think, right? Yeah, I agree. That's a good question, though. I mean, I know we've mentioned some in the past, but I don't know. I think that they that, that Direwolf does a really good job of balancing cards' costs and stats and stuff. I mean, like, you saw how aggressively they issued out balance patches in the first year the game was out. And I think things are at a pretty good place right now. I agree with you. And, uh, yeah, like, having all those guys be pro Magic players does not hurt, so... Exactly. I, uh... So, I, I, uh, I work down the street from their office, actually, here in Denver, and, uh... I went out to eat with, uh, a lot of those guys, um... 
a few several months ago now and i i just i left just like with this incredible amount of faith in the work they were doing in this game and especially because we've seen it too like we've seen like three three expansions now and uh right they've all been good so i agree parthenax is pretty underplayed could do with a buff yeah definitely Let's buff yeah. that guy yeah i can't think of a better choice Parthenax isn't even underplayed in the matches where he's played. He gets played like five or six <laughs> fucking times. <laughs> well, get him back. Well, yeah. get him back. Oh my god. I mean, it's something that I'll, you know, that I'll probably say until the card that I want to exist actually gets printed. But uh, in the very first episode of the Forge that I ever did, I suggested a change to Somerset Orrery, and I think that's what I would go back to. Because right now, Orrery is like the meme of memes for being potentially the worst card in the game. And yeah. uh, it doesn't even see play in meme decks. It doesn't even, like, it's just bad. But yeah. uh, the change that I suggested in the video, though I strongly suggest go watching it, um... <laughs> is that I would like to see Somerset Orrery still cost 6, because I think that the effect I'm proposing is powerful, but instead of shuffling all the prophecies back into your deck, I want it to say, draw one card, and then pick a card in your hand and put it in the top of your library, and still have three charges. Because when you do that, then it extends your hand by, like, one, but it also gives you the ability to either throw prophecies on the top, or bluff throwing prophecies on the top. I think that there's just a lot more interesting dynamics... Um, it would also make things like Mechanar, who's coming out in the next set, be extra cheeky because you would potentially have control over what would be an option. Um, I think that a card like that would be worthy of, you know, paying six for no board presence. You know, that big tempo loss that Orrery would, would, you know, need to be justified at that point. And one yeah. of the things I love about digital card games is that you can make changes like this, like on the fly, you know? Yeah. I agree. Like you could all of a sudden make like if there's three cards you really like that aren't seeing play, you can just give them a little boost and maybe they'll see more play. We had a conversation a couple weeks ago about like <clears throat> uh, different philosophical approaches that balancing could take in a digital card game. And one of the things that we discussed was whether or not enough players would enjoy a switch to a, a more rapidly evolving format that was intentionally made uh, to change regularly by introducing balance changes that would uh, move a card from a tier 2 filler, tier two, 3 filler to a, an obvious tier 1 best in, in cost type thing. And doing that on a regular basis, like every month, every two months maybe, to uh, give players just enough time to figure out the meta before things change again. Yeah. And, um, it's something that you can do in a digital card game. It's interesting because it's, it is risky though, you know? Right. Like, you yeah, have I to, mean, you alienate disrupting people. the balance. Right. Exactly. And like, yeah. you're disrupting the balance of the format. Yeah. Like you don't know, like what it, you have to change it back. Do you change one card back? You, there's a lot of questions that are asked when that, when something like that's going to happen, you know? I, I agree. I mean, it's, it's impractical for a couple of reasons, but I think that as a, you know, a really invested player, I think I'd be really excited by it, but, um, because I just, you know, I recognize the shortcomings of the idea, though. Yeah, right. But I like like you, I think it's cool. Like, I think it's a cool idea, and I think it's definitely something that could be done. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to see it. That'd be, that'd be sweet to just experiment with something like that. Yeah. A goat in a boat thinks unrelenting force needs a buff. It's one shot i never seen on a ladder. I've seen more unrelenting force in the last few weeks than I saw in the last few months. Um, it's an obviously... It's not as obviously powerful as some other cards, but in the right meta, it's fantastic, right? Like, Unrelenting Force in, uh, let's say, a mirror match, a 47-card mirror match, where one deck is running Unrelenting Force, uh, you're going to be able to make some incredible tempo swings with that card, right? Like, I also think that against Rage decks, and I think this is why the card's seeing more play lately, uh, Unrelenting, you know, setting up an Unrelenting Force on level 2 so you can shout back their Rage target, can be great, especially since the most popular Rage deck right now is um, uh, Rage Archer, which doesn't have the opportunity to ramp. They're never going to play their Rage creature and their Rage in the same turn. Yeah. So. Looking through chat a little bit. Yep, I was trying to get caught up on the questions here as well. I mean, I do agree that Underlanding Force probably should deserve a buff if only because like 
is there a more iconic shout right like of all the things that you would want like don't we want people saying fuss roda more than anything like when you think sky right and that's that was the funny thing too because you're like oh the weakest one is the most iconic right that's true Um, let's get some, some rapid fire questions, guys. Let's, uh, any, anything you want to get out, uh, can be about life, legends, Frank, Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not like that suggestion? I tried to stay away from the, uh, sexual harassment stuff because your suit against me is still pending. <laughs> I, b I believe you just lost that suit by talking about it, my friend. <laughs> Well, I mean, we did talk about butt touching already, so... I'm pretty sure, Justin, this means I get to be president. Oh, oh yes. shit, dude. Oh, oh shit. Oh. That's that's more true than it's not true, unfortunately. <laughs> America. Yeah. America. Jesus. Yeah. It's an awkward place right now. It is, dude. You, I mean, obviously, you can tell which way the show leans. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I, I'm glad. I, I feel like we're, uh, we're, we're pretty similar yeah, right good. now, so... All right, yeah, rock on. I mean, we're nerfing butt touching, and uh, we yeah. we agree that certain people should be escorted yeah. out of the White House. So yeah, let's. Uh, let, where's my Shadowfin priest to silence that guy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm bringing Perfect. a full so, bringing a full circle, guys. Bringing it home. Go team. Go team. Well, I mean, they've already destroyed most of the supports, so oh shit, that's true. I guess yeah. he, I guess silence is the the more relevant ability here. We just need to make sure that Robert, Robert Mueller has Ward. <laughs> oh God, please! <laughs> make that Every time his name pops up in the news, I'm like, I do a fist pump. Yeah, me too, dude. I'm like, bring it, bring the yeah. hammer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so we got uh, some coming in. The long afternoon asks, uh, what do you guys think about more bonuses for paying for packs, or do you think it's fine the way that it is? I think Elder Scrolls Legends gives a lot of stuff. Like, if you yeah. look at things like like Hearthstone, like Elder Scrolls gives you a lot more. I agree. I'm sorry, my cat is on my lap. <laughs> hey, never, you don't, don't ever apologize for cute animals, man. Hey, Justin, we just talked about pussy grabbing. All right, keep it toned down. <laughs> look, when you're famous, they let you do anything. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I guess for me, I would say like I I. I can understand why people would potentially want like some bundles or holiday deals or whatever, but with the amount of stuff that Legends kind of gives you like for free, there's a part of me deep down that says I don't want them to adjust pack prices until they get some other business model online. Whether that's paying for cosmetics, whether that's paying for um, you know alternate art cards, whatever the case may be, like, you've got to give me another reason to put money into the game before you stop taking the money for, like, the one last thing that I'm still paying for. Because I, I want to give them money because I want to keep playing the game and, like, that takes capital, right? So, yeah. to me, I would say it's fine. I would say it's fine for now, and if they give us more avenues, then maybe they should look at it then, but... Yeah, I think that the economic model for Legends... I mean, I don't know what their side of it looks like, how profitable it is, but as far as as a player goes, it's perfect. And the problem is you don't want to expand into, like, Battlefield 2 territory, where yeah, you, <laughs> you know, these, uh, these price points where people are like, I paid for the game already, why am I paying for right. every single feature of the game in loot crates, you know? So, right. yeah, microtransactions, you got to find the balance, and I think, I think Elder Scrolls Legends does a good job right now. Yeah, yeah. I don't need to uh, spend eight hundred dollars to unlock Red Brahmin. That would be. <laughs> yeah. You got to rent him in a loot crate. You can't even craft him. Yeah. So yeah. That, that, I was gonna say that was in there. Depending on loot boxes that affect gameplay or gameplay progression. Uh, I mean, to me, I guess that is packs in a way, right? Like the packs really are just our loot boxes. But right, but you can craft them too, which is yeah. a right. significant difference, right? So you don't have to. You don't have to keep opening packs until you get Parthenax, like, you can just make him. Yeah, it's, if you right. to. it's like the Overwatch model. Like, you open loot boxes, but eventually you get the whatever thing you want after enough. Right, and but, like, you, yeah, and you can, like, play all of the game without ever buying a loot box, too, because right. they're all cosmetic, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we also yep. had, um, now that we have lots of support removal cards, how about support protection cards? Uh, while this card's in play, your supports are invulnerable. Um, mm. I'll... I'll weigh in first, and I'll say that I would actually prefer to see recursion over protection. Like, yeah, give me soul tear for supports. 
I agree. I don't like protection because, like, if you don't have a way to deal with, like, there's certain supports that you just really need to get rid of. And I, I don't think you should have that kind of strength. Well, I think I think that it's both that for me, but then also um, when you think about the unique legendaries that we were talking about earlier, even if I'm protecting it, like I blow up the guy protecting it and then I kill High Hrothgar, well, that's still the only High Hrothgar in your deck, right? So if you're going to yeah. give us cool yeah. tools, like in my opinion, you got to, if we can't run more than one, then we have to have ways to get it back. Otherwise, we lose the fun build around cards. Yeah, yeah. especially if it's a one of, you're just like, well, that was fun. Yeah, exactly. Ozymandios points out that Red Brahmin comes with the guarantee that he's always in your opponent's hand. Think of the value. <laughs> That's true, dude. Every time I'm playing something that is particularly meme or stupid, my opponent has Red Brahmin. <laughs> Now, if I spent oh. the $800 and they would never have Red Brahmin again, like maybe that's a loot crate I'd buy. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, someone flying flying boots at Elder Scrolls is so generous. Six months of playing this casually, I have a larger collection than one and a half years of Hearthstone. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I agree. Um, I agree. So, Immortal King said, uh, I've been playing a lot of games this month, and I find that it is harder for me to climb this month than any month in the past. Do you think this is indicative of a, uh, indicative, sorry, of a larger player base, a more varied deck list that is being played against, a bit of both, or am I just playing like crap? And well, the the last new content release was long enough ago that like while the meta is not like solved solved, um, you know, tournaments are still occasionally featuring new stuff. Um, it's settled, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, what I would say, like, more than anything, is I think that it is uh, both, like, a larger player base, but also um, we're now at a point where the people who would have started at, uh, like, Heroes of Skyrim launch slash, like, the people who just heard about the game when it was mobile release or E3, we're at a point now where all of those people between Twitch drops and playing the game likely have enough to play more than just their one deck. So yeah. the meta is going to be... Um, I think faster in its evolution. Uh, in fact, I would dare say that in many ways it feels like there's almost like a nightly meta, right? Like I can be playing one night and see uh, a bunch of scout decks. And if I play the next night, I might not see any scout decks, but even more so, I, even if I see scout, I might be a completely different brand. Like last night, for example, I saw three pure blood elders and I hadn't seen any at all previously in the month right so i just think that people are always trying to you know they have the card pool now to be fluid and always kind of try to stay ahead of the game and that's going to make planning for it more difficult plus like every every night's different like you can have one night where you play against a bunch of ridiculous stuff one night where you play against the same deck seven times like yeah like I, my my experience with digital card games is that like ranked games and and there's no real pattern to them like it's pretty random from night to night, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> um, could so, you guys spitfire some titles you guys would want? So, like, achievements in-game, I guess he's uh, the long afternoon's talking about? Absolutely. Um, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, adding more achievement-type things. Uh, I'd love to see more t uh, titles related to doing things with unique legendaries. I mean, there's some for Gortwog, there's some for Debate Fear. By the way, uh, getting the Debate Fear one kind of a slog since that's kind of an unplayable card. <laughs> but yeah. uh, I think that you could assign a, a title to capitalizing on each unique legendary's ability to encourage people to play some of the more esoteric ones. I like that. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for me, in terms of like titles and achievements, I think that you should get at least a title for hitting Legend your first time, just because there should be something minor for doing it, right? That's one yeah, of the complaints. Yeah, it's a big deal. One of the complaints right. that we often hear is like, I hit Legend and I, I don't really get anything for it. Um, I mean, you could just literally get a title that says Legend. <laughs> right, like that's what I'm saying. Like, just give them That'd something. That'd be pretty anyway. sweet, actually. Um, I mean, it's so simple. <laughs> but uh, like I would also, I, I wouldn't mind stuff tied to Unique Legends, but I would like to see things that were more, um, more interesting, like for like you would have to build a deck to do it. So for example, I'd like to see something where it was like more involved. Play a card from every attribute in a game. 
So that then oh, I would like yeah. pack in like battle mages onslaughts and reveal the unseens and stuff so that I could try to get the random effects that give me stuff from the other attributes, right? Like yeah. cheeky stuff where I would say like, okay, like not that like, with not the unique legends, it. like the unique legends ones are cool because you can build a deck around them, but because they're unique, like half the time you're just playing like three or four games before you even draw the damn thing. And then you got to hope it lives long enough for it to, you know, pull the orc out or hope that Ulfric lives so I can play a shout. And I want more, like, build around for this, like, cooler, unique scenario. Uh, you always want to make sure you pull the orc out. That's the uh, that's the first step, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's just, you got to be safe about it, you know? Yeah. Orcs oh, are Catholic. Worth it. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry, I, I thought he was making a pullout joke, so I said orcs are Catholic. Oh, god damn. Yeah, dude. no, I was. That was, yeah, it was just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, you know, an old pull the orc out joke. Everybody knows those. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I do, <laughs> I do want to catch up real quick because it was a while back. But uh, Joffrex said that he had tried Gwent and it didn't stick for him. You know, do we think that they would enjoy Legends? And to that, I would say it's hard to tell, right? I don't obviously know what you enjoy, but they are vastly different games. Uh, yeah. Gwent yeah. is very much like just math. It is literally like, <laughs> I need to have more points than my uh, opposing player. And I, now I, I understand that I am not doing the game justice. I've played a lot of Gwent. i played a ton in closed beta. I've got stuff on my YouTube channel from it. But at yeah. its core, Gwent is really just like a, you know, I need to have more points than my opponent. And there is very little board interaction. And when there is board interaction, and what I mean by that is like between you and your opponent, a lot of it is literally just like hiding the fact that it's still just math, right? Like, I could have something where I play it and it's worth 10 points on my side, or I can have something where I play it and it's worth 4 on my side, but I take 6 away from yours. Those are two different cards, but the truth is it's still 10 points either way, right? Like, 10 points is 10 points is 10 points. So, Gwent is just a different game because there is no, like, combat involved. There isn't that, like, ebb and flow of the match. Um, they're just different so if Gwent didn't stick i would say at least try legends um and go from there also like gwent has been described as a game where like the better player wins more consistently whereas like games like elder scrolls legends or hearthstone or magic like they all have a, a higher variance point yeah i can agree with that i found myself losing a lot in gwent and i'm not particularly smart so <laughs> <laughs> It yeah. makes sense. I follow. The self-deprecation yeah. is wonderful. Yeah. Well, I mean, like like Charmer, I was in the Gwent closed beta, and <clears throat> I don't play Gwent anymore. It's an interesting game, um, but it just wasn't for me. And I feel like, as someone who loves Legends, you know, if you didn't like Gwent, give Legends a try. Yeah. So, uh, we've got... Somebody suggested a title, Buzzkill Silence 200 Creatures with Red Bramon. That's kind of cheeky. That'd be great. <laughs> um, That'd be great. I like that, actually. So we have uh, absolutely Terabad, yet another user whose name I adore. Um, if Bethesda did manage to make a big tournament, would you be opposed to the top player being offered unique legendary titles and alt arts for winning? Oh, no way. Those are great, Those are great uh, prizes. Yeah, why would I be opposed to someone else getting something? Yeah, well, and the thing is, like, that doesn't affect the game, right? Like, that's, those right. aren't, like, unique cards that you're getting that no one else has. Right. Those are just titles and, and alt arts, and that's that's super sweet. Like, yeah. if I sit across from someone who won, like, a world championship or, like, a national championship or something, and they play an alternate art Odeving, like, yeah. that's awesome. Cool, you've earned that. Right. So right. Odeving just Odeving is just given the finger. So <laughs> I, would, I would screenshot it and post it on Twitter. I'd be like, this is yeah. cool. Yeah. So I'm going to be the buzzkill on two ends. I I wouldn't like it because as the completionist in me, right? Uh, like I I want the opportunity to try to collect and because well, this you have, game you have that opportunity, you just have to win. Well, but here's the <laughs> like because this game doesn't have a secondary market available, I can't mm -hmm. just like go to eBay to fill out my collection, right? So I think there is something to like put some stock in that. Like cuz we we hear even occasionally now from some newer players like, "Hey, I wasn't around for that one rumble." You know, how do I get the piercing javelins, right? Um, but also part two, one of the things that Magic did that I always liked was that, you know, they let certain winners of events um, 
you know, have their hand in aiding uh, in the design of a card. And to me, that's yeah. much, 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 much more interesting and valuable. And I, I like, I could care less about alternate. Like, even though I'm a completionist, like at the end of the day, I could kind of care less about alternate art. But I would probably train for months on end if I thought I had the shot at getting to design something. Especially if the card had your likeness, like the magic uh, versions did in the Imitational. Yeah. <clears throat> That would be pretty sweet. Do you think we'll ever... Uh, the Long Afternoon also writes, do you really think we'll never get the chance to get the alt javelin art again? I feel like they'll give another chance. I don't know. That's a good question. Mm, I mean, like, I guess I, I'd rather people have the opportunity to have it than not have the opportunity to have it. Like, it's not like the my enjoyment of that alternate art javelin is diminished by your ability to have it. So, right. You can wash my car. I'll give you one of mine. <laughs> yeah. Hey, car washes. You got a place that. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> there's, there's three of us. Wash each of our cars. We'll give you one. Yeah. You get then you get a, tra- a piercing javelin place that. Yeah. Absolutely. If only we could trade them. Yeah. On that subject, though, I'm really glad we can't trade. Right. Same. I think that's just an, uh, an added layer of complication. Yeah, I agree. So that's interesting if you guys are, um, you're, you're currently saying like you're against trading and I think that's fine in, in this model, but what would you guys, uh, I, I guess I'll say this. We don't know a lot about the game yet, but what are your guys' like just general outlook on Artifact, the game announced for, uh, it's the Dota card game, right? From Valve. Yeah. I've heard nothing about it, so I couldn't say. I've yeah. never played Dota. I don't, I don't Sorry. Yeah, I mean, you probably don't know about the IP, but like, even I've read some articles about like the basics of what the you know plan the game play to be, and I've been kind of hunting for info. But to me, the most intriguing thing about that as a platform is that because it's done you know by the people who do Steam, right? Like you can almost ex- like people are going to expect a secondary market, right? And so. While other games have tried doing a secondary market on Steam as card games, they, they've never really had the resources available that somebody like a Valve would have, and I'm kind of trying to imagine how that's going to go. And then knowing what I know about Dota, where cosmetics and skins and all those things are also like a big deal, um, I feel like they have the infrastructure to to really play up that side of things. I mean, um, I've... I've played games with secondary markets uh, <laughs> for most of my gaming career, but I've, you know, I, I would take a game without a secondary market over a game with a secondary market currently like nine times out of 10. Like there's such I, a complication to secondary markets. Like prices go up, prices go down. If you get an early, you get a good deal on a card. Then it spikes and goes to $40 because everyone's playing it. Or right. you can't find any copies of it or you know, right. the, they're not printing enough or, you know, they, they can't sell you it directly because then they're, you know, then they're acknowledging the secondary. Like, there's so many complications that are involved in the secondary market. Like, what if they don't make this card anymore? Then, you know, it goes up to $100. And, you know, same thing with, like, Elder Scrolls Legends. Like, what if they ever did that? And then you just, the only people you can get the card from are people who had a surplus of them. Like, it's just, so, it's just a level of confusion. Like, if you can just craft cards, it's so much easier. Just play the game. Focus on the game. Don't make the trading and the the secondary market this this secondary game, like this metagame. I agree. What if, what if the uh, secondary market was strictly for cosmetics, though? I think that's fine. And, uh, you know, that's basically what Overwatch does. And again, I think that's great. Because people who care about that kind of stuff can engage with it as much as they want. People who don't, don't aren't disadvantaged by it. Yeah. Because I think about, again, thinking about things on Steam, right, that are kind of already in the same boat. I think of things like uh, CSGO, right, where anybody who has Counter-Strike Go can just play the game, right? But there's this massive secondary market based on their loot boxes and, you know, the skins and the rarities of them. And stuff will send, you know, sell for hundreds and thousands of dollars just because of, uh, you know, the way it looks in game. And yeah, I, I feel like feel like valve knows that card games are like the natural place to go for that sort of thing and that that's what they're going to try to recreate i mean if it works it works like if they're not scamming people and like putting a 25 percent like fee on top of trades or something like cool 
if you know let like people people if people want to enjoy it let them enjoy it like that's totally fine by me but it's not really my thing like i'm i'm i think trading is kind of draining like it's just exhausting yeah i'd rather do i'll deal less with that and i'd rather just deal more with playing the game i agree so so the other thing that often comes up with legends right is this idea of you know lack of an official uh you know tournament scene and you know supported mm -hmm. prizes and you know rightfully so like the esports thing is a criticism so the other reason that artifact potentially intrigues me is that you know if you're not into mmos and you don't know dota and whatever um like it's it's an esport like some people would argue it might be the esport if you're not familiar the prize pool at the international this last year was 24 million dollars yeah, they also crowdsource their pricing, which is an insanely good idea. Yeah, so I'm not sure why other games don't do that. I don't know why other games don't do that either. And even if they, they like for me, they could get super uh, creative with it too, right? Like offer this thing where you buy alternate art and a portion of That's all what the they purchases, did. right? Like yeah, like you'd get like in-game pets and stuff, and you know if you donated X amount and or you know bought it or whatever. Yeah, but <laughs> that money would go to the prize pool. So and, that's fascinating. So, you know, again, this is the IP, even if you know nothing about Dota, this is the IP that they're going to make a card game, like, for, and so if that's having, like, granted, that's the big tournament, but that's just a tournament that had a prize pool of almost $25 million, like, I can't fathom what the prize pools are going to be like for card games. Like, it's going to, you know, I, I've heard all this stuff about Hand of the Gods lately for their $50,000 qualifier thing, and I again like i said last week on the cast i'm kind of not a fan of that game after having tried it but it's getting recognition just for like 50 grand like when artifact hits and yeah. they announce their first prize pool like it's going to be a big deal and so I just not even just legends but just card games in general i wonder how it's going to kind of change the way the digital space works that's a good question i'm waiting for you know i i want elder scrolls to come into its own as far as um like tournament play, like big events. So, I mean, I think they're, I think they're getting there slowly, but I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to when it happens. Like when it's, when they're like, when they legitimize themselves like a, in a, an esport force in the collectible card game arena, digital card game <clears throat> arena. I agree. I think, uh, I mean, I know it's being worked on. Like it'll, it's going to happen sooner rather than later. I think that uh, the game itself, um, honestly, I think the game itself could use a little bit more, a, a, a slightly larger card pool before you launch into it, right? Because, I mean, like, people were clamoring for this when there was just the core set, right? And now we have almost twice the cards with the three sets that have come out since then. Uh, and the meta is a little bit more diverse, I would say, sometimes. But I think that in order to have a, an interesting to watch esports, because I mean, like, I'm not kidding myself into thinking like I'm going to be playing in these tournaments. Like, uh, as somebody who's going to be viewing them, like I want as many different types of things to be p possible for players to be playing uh, that there can be, right? So yeah. like, I want I want an interesting viewing experience, and I think that necessitates a larger card pool than we have right now. Also, you, you, an, an easier thing if it helps the. Uh you know, the companies putting the, the events together is that like, you could just have prizes paid out in Bitcoin because. Oh yeah. That's a great idea, dude. <laughs> it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Get, get on that. Well, it's a bit of a meme there. Yeah. <laughs> dude, I just feel like every, I, I, let me get into the Bitcoin thing for a second, man. I feel like every dude, I, every dude I grew up with who was like, wearing Abercrombie and uh, this is like, you know, I was in high school, I don't know, 20 years ago, like wearing Abercrombie and uh, too much cologne and listening to LFO was also really into like either becoming a real estate agent when they got older. And when that didn't work out, now they sell buy mine Bitcoin and shit. And I just, I just, I don't, oh my God. I just don't get it. It's just those, it's those bros, the guys who dropped out of college after a year. Wow. Like, <laughs> You just have a different crew there in Colorado because legitimately where I live, all the people who like mine Bitcoin and are into it are literally like the people that 10 years ago 
played fantasy football like in the basement with like paper tracking because it wasn't online and i know this because i'm one of those guys right like i played fantasy football when you had to turn in your lineups by hand and then we had to hunt for stuff because it was like the nerd thing to do yeah no i don't know man dungeons and dragons for uh for jocks right all the dungeons and dragons guys i knew are like engineers and shit now yeah, they yeah. There was a ton of them when I when I was in Seattle because Microsoft was right there. Right, right. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I struck a nerve with the Bitcoin. I just thing think adjusting. Bitcoin's. I just think Bitcoin's stupid. Like, is it because you have a big investment in Litecoin? No, ha 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 ha. Are you are you uh, are you on it the Ethereum not. train? He's a big Ethereum fan. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> No, you know, Bitcoin is not my cryptocurrency of choice, guys. I'm going to come clean, all right? I bought a whole bunch of pogs, right? And I (laughs) thought, this is the currency of the future. Well, how good are your slammers, man? Oh, man, they are the best ever. There's like. You got some nice slammers? I got some great slammers. I got one with John Elway on it. I think you need to hold these. I think these are a long hold, man. Yeah. Somebody (laughs) offered me a bunch of uh, one of those little, like the little stuffed dolls you used to be able to get. Um, They're animals. Pets, something like Beanie Babies? Know. Beanie Babies. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Beanie Babies. Somebody offered me a bunch of Beanie Babies for my pogs. I was like, get the fuck out of here. What, what do I look like, a sucker to you? Yeah, I got this. I just can't wait till we're off the air and I get chewed up by Justin because he's like, dude, you assumed. I told you about the Bitcoin. You, you assumed my cryptocurrency gender and I was Shut offended. Up, dude. I do not do that <laughs> off the air. <laughs> uh. I shouldn't have said anything about Bitcoin. <laughs> no, hey, I think I'm, it's, I think I'm it's all the better for it. for it because I brought it up, so whatever. I'm going to get doxxed by some Bitcoin nerd. Nice. Yeah. Get a load of this guy. He made fun of our cryptocurrency. Yeah. We my did first, it, Reddit. My first ever cosplay will be me in a, just a giant Bitcoin costume. That's awesome. Nice. Yeah. I'm Bitcoin, man. Absolutely. All right. Uh, we did have uh, two interesting questions before we got on the Bitcoin rant. Um, yeah. The first one was, what theme would you like to have for the next non-story expansion? That's a good question. Fallout. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Morrowind would be my choice. Uh, I think for me it would be Oblivion, just because they I mean, have all of Oblivion to kind of work with. Yeah. yeah, they have a lot of backstory to go through. That's true. Um, or I, what I think would be really cool is if they just did a complete 180 and they were like, here's an Elsewhere expansion. We're just going to give you a bunch of stuff you haven't even seen in the games yet. Oh, that would be... But they can they can do that. Yeah, that's yeah, true. There's a lot to pull from. Yeah. Yeah, just or, or just do Fallout. That's cool, right? That's yeah. totally... That'll fit thematically. Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to equip my Dunmer Nightblade with a quick, rocket grenade. Quick thought on Fallout. I want them to, instead of making a card game, I realized the other day what I'm missing in my life digitally. Um, yeah. So as somebody who's played a lot of games, uh, yeah. card games for sure, but a lot of games, including plenty of tabletop miniatures games, like yeah. Mage Knight, Hero Clicks, those, you know, all of that. What I want in my life is like the digital version of like strategy tabletop <laughs> games, right? Like I played Shardbound on stream a bit and that's close, but that's still kind of a card game at its base. I want to like open packs to get my units, but then I also want to build armies based on like a point system. And I want to be able to get like alternate art versions of my units. And I think Fallout could be an IP for that because I could have like different guys in power armor or whatever. And you make like a mini army and go fight on a tabletop, but digitally. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, the, the problem is like, there's like a thousand ideas. Like there's so many ideas that it's so hard to implement all these things, you know? Like the idea of like picking a, an idea out of the air and like, like even if you really love it, like, and having that become a thing is so minuscule, you know? Oh, yeah. No, I I realized a long time ago I'm a very, like, niche audience, and the thing that I want is not what everybody else wants. Right, yes. <laughs> like, like, I think that's true. But it doesn't it doesn't make me want it any less. Right, of course not. It shouldn't. Um, so one of the other questions we had was, what meme deck would you want to become mid-tier viable? <clears throat> um, Dwemer? Yeah, Dwemer is a good answer. <laughs> it's the only one likely to 
go from meme to actual. Yeah, like, they're close. They're real close. I agree. I mean, I have, you know, it's, it's one of those things, like, with the right draws with the cards you have right now, you can win games on a ladder with Dwemer. Yeah, it's not impossible. For right. Me, for me, it's a uh, reanimator. As somebody, yeah. who, like, one of my favorite decks when I very, like, when I was very early in my Magic career, I loved playing, like, old school, you know, Ashen Ghoul style reanimator, uh, all sorts of weird stuff. And, it's, like, Soul Tear is close. But, like, I really, I want an excuse to play that two drop where you draw a card and discard a card so that I can, like, cheat something onto the board super early, right? Like, I know that there's some balancing issues there, and it would be kind of hard to fine-tune, but I would really like to see that as an option. Wasn't you know, that destroyed a graveyard, a discard pile? Yes. Like it's Banish. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the card. The card is uh, Memory Wraith, and it banishes your opponent's graveyard. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, get wrecked. Absolutely. <laughs> they're, they're, they're predicting your, your reanimator strategy, and they're, they're preemptively printing this. Yeah. You know, one of the things I like about the kind of, like, hate cards, if you want to call them that, in Legends, is, and, and there are not very many of them, but what I like about them is that because this format has no sideboarding, uh, because the game has no sideboarding, right? Mm -hmm. Like, th what these are are just like safety valves in case something goes ho horribly dramatically wrong. <laughs> yeah, you just main deck these cards, and you're like, well, I'm going to seal out of this deck on the ladder, so. Right. And I think that by virtue of their existence, even if they're never really played, they'll make they'll cause people to make different decisions about what they put in their deck and what they take on the ladder, especially right after the expansion drops. And I think that, you know, we've mentioned in the show before that the the illusion of change in, on the ladder creates change on the ladder and these cards existences will probably make people make different decisions without ever actually doing anything <laughs> yeah I, I agree with you like their existence causes you to play differently or build a deck differently so right yeah I mean the number of people who the minute we revealed memory race said scout is dead was mm -hmm pretty overwhelming even though i it's definitely fully not. don't believe that to be the case but it's not how that works like it, it doesn't work the same in right, practice but, as it does in theory yeah but the thing is is perception is reality right so mm -hmm. the scout will drop in popularity even though it might not have dropped in power level just because of the existence of other cards yeah but so traditionally people wait for the actual like if you start playing memory wraith like then we'll you know adjust our plans but Right. Like, you don't just assume everyone's going to be playing Memory Wraith randomly and then right. stop playing your Tier 1 deck. I'm sure just enough people will. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, definitely. There's definitely going to be some people. I mean, there are those people who... Uh... And it's not a terrible strategy. Memory Wraith's an interesting example of this because uh, Control Mage is pretty bad against Ramp Scout. And Ramp Scout often beats Control Mage by the endless value it can achieve with soul tear and looping parthenax so a five five for five is something you can win with in a control deck because like who cares what you win with as long as you take control of the game so it's not like it's a bad card in other matchups right. necessarily it's still a five five for five yeah right yeah um we also had a question about what tribes you'd like to have expanded on right so like obviously orcs is a known synergy but what are some of the other ones Hmm. Argonians, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Like, there's just no, there's no real like. There's not a lot of Argonians, so there's, there's no coherent strategy yet with them. Right. There's know? no Argonian strategy. Yeah. They're su they're suffering from reptile dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I that admit. was very good. I liked it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I Your timing is 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 good. I would Thanks. like to see some sort of like. Khajiit strategy developed that wasn't pilfer based. Um, yeah, I agree. Which is hard because that's kind of their identity. Yeah, yeah. I mean it is right now, but I, I don't know. Like maybe they create like skooma in the game or something, and they just have a bunch of stuff that interacts with that or something. I don't know. Yeah. Skooma would be an interesting mechanic to work with. You know, there are cards in Hearthstone I'm thinking of that... Uh, and, and actually, there's there's the Spear item card in Legends, too, that buff your creatures or damage your opponent's creatures. I can see Skooma being sort of a modal card like that. Mm 
Yeah, Long Afternoon also is asking about more goblins. Where's the uh, goblins at? To me, I actually think that they're already fine. Uh, in my mind, they're the number two tribe behind orcs right now. Um, yeah. Go go goblins works well enough already. I don't want to deal with more of it. I agree. The interesting thing about the goblin tribe too versus all the other tribes is because all the goblins are green, like you can build a whole for a host of different kinds of goblin decks. You know, you can put goblins into archer, scout, monk, an assassin, and each one feels a lot different. So I think it's a really well done tribe in that respect. Here's an interesting question. Um, JT Graphic asked, mm -hmm. uh, do you think there is value in not using the new cards to capitalize on the lack of expertise and experience on the ladder to advance faster early on uh, in the month? I'm assuming he means like once December rolls around for that season. Yeah. This is an interesting question because it, 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 it presumes that, that you will have an advantage with a... Uh, an existing deck, right? Like, what if something yeah. in the new set's just really good against the existing decks or just right. strong enough on its own to dethrone them? Like, there's no guarantee that your existing deck is actually going to beat these strategies. Right. Yeah, if there's any obvious linear strategy out of the new set that just crushes something from the old meta, like, you're going to make a poor decision. Yeah. For me, I think that the answer is that, you know, you don't, you don't play the old stuff with that train of thought for two reasons. The first reason is... It's making the assumption that the other decks are still good because they have had more time to be built to be optimal, but they were built with a different card pool. So just because those lists were optimal before, it doesn't mean that you're not going to run into something weird now. But part two of it is, you know, quite frankly, that uh, the new cards are fun and we don't have a competitive scene like where the ladder standing matters yet. So take advantage of this experience now while you can. That might not always be the case. And, and even I'm, if it does, uh, like, taking a day fun. off to just play with the new cards is, like, completely reasonable, right? Like, Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. This is the best time to be... Uh, <clears throat> to get to give yourself the risk of losing a bunch of games by being creative with a deck, right? Like, yeah, if you don't think... That. If you don't think you can build a deck that beats Scout Ramp and Agro Crusader, like, that's cool. On the last day of November, you're going to have an opportunity to build something that you just think is good in a vacuum. Which is a different thing than a deck that works in the current meta. All right, let's take uh, I don't know, like just a couple more and wrap it up. We are actually coming up on uh, three hours now. This is officially the longest that we've ever ran, which is saying yeah, we're hitting that three us. hour mark. Yeah. We're getting really <laughs> we're getting really bad at this, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I ran out of gas like 20 minutes ago. I got, I was exhausted by the Bitcoin discussion. I've been stifling yawns. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've been, I've, I have noticed. I can't stop thinking about vaping. Yeah, well... <laughs> as, uh, as somebody with, you know, mental illness, insomnia, and two small children, I gave up on sleep a long time ago, so I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. Nice. <laughs> At least you know. Like, you know what you're in for, so... Yeah. I'm committed. Uh, somebody wants to know what Hunter's favorite toy is. Uh, Hunter has a Kong. If you guys aren't familiar, it's like a... They're, they're like red or black, usually. They're really big and round. They're thick rubber. And uh, they're great for dogs because they're basically indestructible. And you can either throw them or they can... Chew, you can put toy... You can put treats in them and they can chew on them and try to get the treats out. So it occupies them. And that's probably his favorite thing. Yeah, the snowman shaped things. Yep, definitely. Yes. yes. And you can also put peanut butter in those as well. Those are also a good, that's also a good idea because it occupies them for like ever. Right, Chief? Yeah, it's especially cruel to my dogs because pugs don't have like faces, right? <laughs> like everything is mushed. And so they, they, can't, they can't get into the Kongs or anything. <laughs> Hunter's got a long snoot, so he's good. Yeah. Did you hear your name? Is that why you're over here now? Okay. All right. Let me uh, refresh this. I'd heard that we were supposed to be getting potentially like one more release in the near future. Somebody had said it in chat earlier, but I haven't seen any news. I've been watching Twitter and watching Reddit, and I didn't see anything. So. Oh, you mean a card? A card? Yeah. 
But well, I, let me let me uh, ask a, a nebulous question that maybe uh, sparks some hype for the next few days. Charmer, have you checked your email since we started doing this? Um, I have not. I have my email turned like off when I'm doing this, just so that I don't have the notifications going off nonstop. All right, I was just curious. All right, something's happening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's it. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> All right. So okay. quick, quick, quick check. Uh, keep an eye out over the next couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. I I wonder if they really understand what they're what they're doing there. He might need some feedback. Anyway, we'll talk about that more later. But. All right. Well. The the best part about like. And, and you know, Frank, this might be old hat to you because you've been, you know, a known name in the in the gaming community for a while now. But like one of the cool parts of this experience for me as a guy who didn't have a lot of gaming background and started playing Legends because I thought it looked fun and uh, bought a webcam because I had a Target gift card I didn't know what to do with. <laughs> That's a good reason. That's legit how it happened. I signed up for this medical study actually, where they, I was like, they're promising me two hundred fifty bucks, and then they paid me in fucking Target gift cards. So I was like, well, okay. So anyway, uh. Like is is like you, people like uh, they want to know your opinions on things that, and they they ask for your feedback and shit and it's very disorienting you know like uh, offering my thoughts on stuff like this and so to get these sorts of emails or these sorts of questions on the on the thing it's really humbling and uh, it's an experience that I'll never forget you know m- long after this ride is over. Yeah, I agree with you, hundred um, percent. Once you feel like you're a part of something bigger uh, and like your opinion is really valuable and something that you you enjoy a lot like elder scrolls legends or you know whatever right. whatever your game may be like it's super awesome I yeah. agree. for me the experience has been wonderful because i now have people like justin and others that i can actually talk to about it because in the past uh on a few rare occasions because i i worked in a comic and gaming shop and i i knew a couple of people i was able to play test and and preview things for other games but it was like back pre-internet so i play tested some of the mage knight stuff for whiz kids and i play tested some stuff for the decipher lord of the rings game when that was around and i remember i enjoyed it and it was some of the most fun i've ever had playing games but it was during the nda days so i couldn't talk to anybody about it yeah right? i know there, that feeling too there, there was no like live reveals there was no like reddit threads there was literally like i get a, an envelope in the mail and like me and the three people who signed the ndas can play it and have fun and then you don't talk about it right so that's it that's the extent of it yeah yeah this has been uh, not only like enlightening but I, I i agree with justin some of the most fun like i've ever had and i will certainly take this with me long after i'm done with it so agree completely yeah Rock on. Frank, I want to thank you for coming on the show, man. You've, you've been an amazing guest. I've really enjoyed having you on here, and it's been fun talking to you, too, and we'd love yeah, to have you back. I would love to. You guys have been awesome. Like, this Thanks. has been a blast. Thank you very much. And I, I, you know, I'm looking forward to finishing our Bitcoin conversation, too, so. Absolutely. I mean, maybe you'll invest in my Nigerian off, offshore <laughs> banking industry with your Bitcoins. Don't you have a, an uncle that needs, a, like, a some kind of medical surgery? I, I yeah, thought you emailed well, me earlier. Look, I can't, I can't save my mom if you don't put fifty thousand dollars in, in an account for me. My name will be on it, but you'll have complete control over it. Totally makes sense. I can't. What, what could possibly go wrong? Listen, I'm in a jail Sorry. in Florida, and I need you to send me bond money. Oh I my need, god! I need you to oh send it Western Union. I need it wired. Dude, when I was in prison, my grandmother received a call like that from someone claiming to be me, that's, and she's like, "That's messed up, dude." I, I called her, you know, like as I would like once a month and she told me the story. She's like, and of course I knew it wasn't you. Cause like I knew which prison you were at. I was like, Oh shit. That's messed <laughs> up, dude. Yeah. That's funny. I hadn't thought about that in years. That's good. Yeah. Hey, is this Justin's gra- my grandma? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. Oh, well, yeah, this was fun. And, uh, we look forward to, to doing this again. Well, I have to get yeah, together I'll, sometime I'll... and play games as well. Yeah, that'd be sweet. I'm sure we'll uh, we'll be in touch on Twitter too. So sweet. you guys can also follow me on Twitter if you want it at Frank Lapore. So yes, absolutely. I encourage everybody to do that, and don't forget to check out Frank's uh, content at ChannelFireball.com and then the Channel Fireball YouTube page as well. They got a lot of great stuff over there, and he does uh, some pretty interesting stuff. 
Yeah. And I'll, uh, just like you guys, I'm sure I'll be streaming more Elder Scrolls Legends when the new set drops, so that, that should be sweet. Looking forward to playing that bad boy. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm putting uh, Frank's Twitter in the chat, uh, his website, which also has a link to his Twitch. Uh, he does stream if you love magic content. He's great for that as well, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was awesome. I'm glad I, uh, glad I got to chat with you guys for three whole hours tonight. <laughs> Yeah. Three yeah, hours, dude. Three, three hours you'll never get back. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <dude. laughs> we go grab, take this take this guy out. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right, guys. Have a good night, though. Good night. You as well. Peace out, Frank.